morning and you're all very welcome to the Brennan Hotel here in Killarney for this conference being hosted by South Kerry Development Partnership in conjunction with the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere, all focused on Rhododendron ponticum. It's an invasive species I suppose we've all heard about, we're all here for a reason to hear about why it's a big issue, why we need to manage it and how we can manage it indeed. I suppose a couple of housekeeping issues before we kick off today. Obviously we're living in COVID times, I see everybody is wearing a mask and if you could continue to do so that would be great today. Use the hand sanitizers and of course keep social distancing in mind at all times. Just take an eye out for the different fire exits around the place. We have a window open as well. If anybody feels that they need more ventilation or anything like that, just let us know and we can deal with that as well. The toilets, just if you go out the door there to the right and continue up to the right, you will find the toilets out there. Now we are going to have a couple of tea breaks and we'll have a lunch as well, thanks to the lovely staff here in the Brennan Hotel today as well. And a little bit later on in the conference, we'll be hosting a questions and answers session. So if there is any issue that uh, I suppose springs to mind during any of the presentations today, if you can uh, just keep it in the back of your mind, maybe write it down or whatever, and we will have a very robust questions and answers session a little bit later on as well. I suppose to introduce myself, my name is Ashling O'Brien, I'm a Radio Kerry journalist and for the last five or six years I have been presenting AgriTime which is the farming and rural affairs weekly show on the station and I suppose as a journalist Rhododendron probably featured in one of the quirkiest stories I ever wrote back in 2017, I'm sure you may be familiar with it, when a couple who were camping actually, visitors to the county, Camping in Killarney National Park became so disorientated in rhododendron that they needed to call the Coast Guard to help them to get out of it. It was that thick. And on a further investigation into that, I realised it wasn't the first time that something like this had happened in dense rhododendron. And actually in 2014, I believe it was, above in Tipperary, a couple had to be rescued as well from dense rhododendron forest. So rhododendron is really something that I think a lot of people here in Kerry are familiar with. They might not know a whole pile about it, but they definitely may have heard of rhododendron ponticum. And be familiar with the fact that this is an invasive species, which is threatening our nat native natural habitats. And biodiversity is obviously a, a buzzword. It's something that's very important uh, out there at the moment. And uh, not only to be seen to be aware of an issue but to be doing something about it and I think that's why this conference today is so positive. It's bringing together a range of key stakeholders, experts in their field and this is a real positive space for us all to trash out the issues and to see how we can you know deal with this big issue going forward as well. I suppose Michael Healy Ray once said to the independent TD that he believed nothing short of calling in the army would sort out rhododendron. But today we've assembled not perhaps the defence forces, but we have a, an expert panel uh, for you to, to hear from today. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Trace Higgins from the Munster Technological University, who's a wealth of experience uh, in this area. And uh, we'll also be hearing from Trisha Dean, who's involved with McGillicuddy Reeks European Innovation project which is a fantastic project uh, involving so many stakeholders on our uplands and uh, really is key to I suppose driving forward in this battle against rhododendron ponticum. We're going to be hearing the farmer's perspective as well. This is very important to include landowners and farmers on this journey too. And we'll have practical demonstration videos on how we actually deal with rhododendron. And we'll be hearing from the National Parks and Wildlife Service as well. We're joined by Seamus Hassett, the regional manager as well. And uh, as I said, if we will have a questions and answers session towards the end of the conference today, so keep them in the back of your mind. But to kick off this morning, unfortunately, he was not able to join us in person, but the Minister of State with responsibility for heritage and electoral reform, but more importantly, heritage this morning, Malcolm Noonan has sent us a video. So if you want to sit back and have a listen to what Malcolm Noonan has to say to us. Good morning, everyone, and I want to welcome delegates to the 
inaugural Kerry uh, Biosphere Rhododendron Conference, a really important conference at a critical time for biodiversity, not just in Ireland, but globally. And uh, I think we have a very important uh, decade ahead of us in Ireland, a decade of ecosystem restoration where uh, the ambition of communities throughout the country is being matched by government in terms of resourcing and support for the activities that we all need to be part of to ensure that we have restored habitats, we have habitats that are functioning and habitats are, that are connected. And that's why I think this particular conference is very timely and very important. And I do look forward to observing the outputs uh, later on from, from this conference. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, um, but I, again, I suppose the times we're in, uh, we're getting used to this type of uh, presentation, um, but I just want to wish everybody all the very best. Um, Ireland hosted a very successful Eurobab conference in 2019. Uh, the then Minister, Sean Kine, was uh, the Minister of State for the Gaeltacht, was present to open the conference, and that was supported by uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, both in terms of funding and in terms of providing speakers for the event. I know that was a very successful event. And there's a real strong synergy in our view between uh, the goals of MAB, uh, Man and Biosphere and the UNESCO objectives and our own remit around National Parks and Wildlife Service. We know that nature and that people are, are interconnected, that we're a part of the same story and that we want to achieve the same thing for nature to ensure that communities are, are an intrinsic part of how we restore our habitats and how we deal with in issues like invasive species. So I think the outputs and the work that you're going to, and the speakers that you're going to listen to today uh, will be an important part of adding to our information and the really important work that we have ahead of us, as I said. Um, I, I suppose National Parks and Wildlife Service have carried out quite a number of important taxonomic studies in Killarney National Park in recent years. There's been some very exciting finds of course, uh, the most famous of which being the Kerry Mousetail Fern, which has been found in a number of disparate sites around the National Park uh, over the last number of years. And again, I want to thank all of the scientists and the people involved in, in, in recording and finding th those, um, those recorded species. I think it's really fantastic and very exciting. And it shows something too that, um, that we are still finding new species in Ireland. And I think it's really important uh, with the work that we do with the National Biodiversity Data Centre, citizen science and recording species and ensuring that we have good records throughout the country uh, to help inform our work and to help inform uh, best practice in conservation and restoration of habitats. Um, I suppose to get to the point of the issue of rhododendron management in, Nas in Killarney National Park and throughout the country, I over the past um, number of months, uh, I've travelled the country looking particularly at our own national parks and how different approaches to rhododendron management have been taken. And I think it's really important uh, that we are in a position to learn from the different methodologies that are being used, different ways that are being applied. In Killarney, there's been a long history of volunteer management, both with uh, uh, Groundwork and with uh, Killarney Mehal. And I, I think the work that they've been doing down the years has been hugely important. I was um, fortunate enough uh, many, many years ago to be involved in a number of the groundwork uh, work camps. Um, I think at the time they were being uh, led and supported through VSI as well. Uh, but it was hard work uh, with a mattock up on the hills, very steep slopes. Um, very often you're going into, I think the first year I was there, you're going into some of the much uh, older growth uh, rhododendron. And um, it's, it's really severe work uh, for volunteers. And then going back on subsequent years, uh, trying to reduce down and take out ceilings. And um, I saw over the couple of years I was there, you know, really uh, important progress that had been made in, in trying to make inroads into rhododendron. But it's not, um, it's something that's going to all be with us because the resources for the management of rhododendron ponticum are going to be vast. And we've spent about uh, 1.6 million over the past uh, five to six years in rhodo management. Uh, we've allocated another uh, 500,000 uh, for the Southern Division for, for the coming year. And um, similarly in Connemara, we allocated another 500,000 euro there. So those are significant resources, um, but they're resources that, resources that are needed and they're important. 
Uh, I know that Jamie Hassett is going to be speaking with you later about the work that we've been doing. And I've been with Jamie on the ground in Killarney on a number of occasions now. And I'm really impressed with the level of work and how effective that work has been um, over uh, a period of time. So, you know, in my own view, I think it would be great to be able to, to secure a, a type of management that has a volunteer input, like the metal, but also requires professional management, a contract management. Um, and I think you need the two. The volunteer element of it is not good, it is good in a sense that um, it, it, it will help uh, spread awareness and, and raise awareness around citizen science activity, about the work we all need to do, and lots of people who really want to get out on the ground and actually work and get their hands dirty and actually get out and experience something like that. I think it's really fantastic for young people. It's something uh, youth groups should be involved in. But that in, in itself involves a level of management and support. Uh, that coupled with um, to trying to make serious inroads through professional contract management, I think, is an important part of it. Uh, in Killarney and Glenvey, I saw a different approach to it, where um, uh, and, and they're making significant inroads. Similarly, in um, Wild Neffin, Ballycroy, and in Connemara, um, they're, they're, each of our national parks are taking slightly different approaches. And I think uh, it's very important that we take the outputs and take the learning experiences because they're all different habitats, different types of um, uh, ranges that, that, and, and operational conditions that uh, contractors and staff have to work under. I think that um, it's, it's important that we learn from the different approaches in which might be uh, a, a longer term consistent approach. Um, lots of people here know a lot more about this than I do, but I've been really, I'm really interested in it and really keen to see uh, us make significant inroads into road management over the next number of years. Um, I've met with Killarney Chamber on a number of occasions. I'm really impressed uh, by their level of commitment to the National Park um, because they see it as, a, as an integral part of the town of Killarney and the wider economy. And obviously Kerry Biosphere Reserve incorporates a lot more than just the National Park. There's the Special Protected Area, Eric Boggs, um, and the wider um, land that has been brought in by Kerry County Council. So um, I suppose in summary, I I'd like to wish you all the very best for your deliberations today. Uh, I really look forward to some of the listening to some of the, the learning, the experiences and to reading some of the papers from uh, today's event. It's a really important event and uh, we will be embarking on two important pieces of work next year. One will be the development of a new National Biodiversity Action Plan and the second will be a, a National Invasive Species Strategy. So they're, they're uh, connected with each other and connected with wider issues around river basin management plans. Um, and our next CAP strategic plan. So a lot of these interrelated plans um, and activities over the next number of years are going to be hugely important for biodiversity over the next decade and beyond. Internationally, uh, we have um, virtually attended the COP15 summit in Kunming in China and again reiterated our commitment through the European high level goals for biodiversity. And these are all really uh, important that we continue on an international level that Ireland is playing its part and that is supporting um, and enabling an infrastructure around biodiversity that is uh, required. The resources we put in the last two budgets have been hugely important, not just in getting additional boots on the ground in our national parks, but also in um, ramping up our scientific activity, our scientific unit within MPWS. Um, and all of this is going to contribute positively towards us playing our part in this great big story of nature conservation and restoration over the next decade and beyond. But I want to wish you all all the very best for your deliberations today. Again, apologies, I can't be with you, but I do look forward to going back to Killarney very soon. Uh, I've seen fantastic work, not just in the National Park, but the McGillicuddy Reeks EIP, all of the other projects that, uh, and so many great communities doing amazing work for nature. And I wish you all the very best for today's conference. Gormila Magad.
our thanks to Minister for Heritage Malcolm Noonan there are some very interesting points raised and I think the issue of resources and funding for projects to manage rhododendron very important and pointing to 500,000 euro being allocated for this region very very positive indeed but also I think important to note um, Malcolm Noonan um, I suppose honouring and the commitment of volunteers down through the years and the hard work and the graft it has taken for many, many years of people going out there and tackling this invasive species uh, on the steep slopes, as he said, that he did himself as well. And I'm sure many people in this room have taken part in that important voluntary work as well. And I suppose Minister Newton pointing to the importance of today's conference and uh, uh, pointing to a framework of how we can go forward with this battle against rhododendron pontcombe. Well, our next speaker today is Eleanor Turner. Now, Eleanor is the Biosphere Officer for the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere Reserve with Ker South Kerry Development Partnership. She's from Caradaniel, a small farm in Caradaniel, I believe, a beautiful part of our lovely county. And she took up that role in August of last year. Now, she is responsible for creating and promoting actions that support the aims of the UNESCO MAN and the Biosphere Programme, which I'm sure she's going to tell us a lot more about. She works with local communities on action-based biodiversity conservation projects, which, as Minister Newman said, is so important that we bring communities with us on these journeys as well. She also supports research within the biosphere area and encourages greater connections with the natural and cultural heritage of the area. And that includes people of all age groups, which is very important for generations to come as well. And she also works closely with a range of stakeholders, including the National Parks and Wildlife Service, Kerry County Council, and landowners in the Biosphere Reserve. Now, I'll hand you over to Eleanor Turner. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, Ashley, and a lovely introduction. Um, so as Ashley said, I just came into this position in August 2020. Uh, unfortunately for me, I suppose that was smack in the middle of the COVID restrictions. So a lot of the activities that we've been doing have been online so far, but we're looking forward to stepping more into a, a more active in the community-based role. So I work with South Kerry Development Partnership, and my office is in the Beaufort office, alongside Tricia, who's at the front here, and who will be speaking later who works with the McGill Cuddy Briggs EIP project, another project that sits underneath the South Kerry Development Partnership umbrella. So I'm really delighted to have be participating and hosting this conference today. Uh, it's a first of many things. It's a first conference for the Kerry Biosphere Reserve project. It's a first conference focused solely on rhododendron. And for me, again, it's the first conference that I've hosted in this role and spoken at. So be gentle with me. So I'll give you a little bit of a background to the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. I'm not going to talk too much about rhododendron. I'm going to leave that for the experts a little later in the day. So the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere Reserve is managed in partnership between South Kerry Development Partnership, Kerry County Council, and the National Parks and Wildlife Service. It covers an area of just over 65,000 hectares with a population of over 25,000 people. So what is a biosphere reserve? Well, to put it simply, a biosphere reserve is where nature and culture connect. So there's always a core element of nature conservation. You can say that's really the underpinning ethos behind biosphere reserve. But it's not just about the nature conservation. It's about the people there as well. So it's about our livelihoods, our businesses, how we use the space for recreation, the economy of the area, the society that sits within it. So it's about that interaction that's happening between nature and people. Now this program has a very long history and I'm going to try and give you a very brief overview of how it's got to the point where it is today. So it started with the UNESCO Man of the Biosphere program back in 1971. Today there's 727 biosphere reserves globally, covering a huge amount of the earth with a significant number of people living within them. But how did we get to that stage? Well, if I give you a quick overview of how the environmental conservation movement emerged in the late 60s through the 1970s, it came from uh, concerns over our impact that as humans our activities were having on our environment. And so they started these conversations around what we now term sustainable development. 
And there has been a long process coming from Agenda 21 in the Earth Summit in 92 through the Civil Conference with the Man in the Biosphere, it increased the criteria for what a biosphere reserve requires through to the Millennium Development Goals, and now what we're looking at is the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those. So the Sustainable Development Goals are UN targets. There's 17 of them. I hope some of you have already seen this picture, but I have to say this isn't my favorite way to represent the Sustainable Development Goals. It does give you an idea of the breadth of targets that they're covering. So everything from reducing poverty, to removing hunger, to quality education, and then up down to the biosphere and managing your land, your water, and then peace, justice, and looking at partnerships as well. But they're all kind of separated in nice little boxes kept apart from each other. And when you put them into a real world context, that's not really how they work. So I find it more helpful to look at them this way. Now this image was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Centre by a researcher looking at the sustainable development goals and how they are embedded within each other. And this, I think, is a perfect way to help describe how a biosphere is trying to operate. So on the base of the pyramid, you have the sustainable development goals that are relevant to our biosphere. I swear I don't just like the image because it has the word biosphere in it. It's really useful. So you have life on land, life below water, clean water and sanitation, and climate action. So this is about looking after our environment, creating a habitable space that we can sustain for generations to come. And on top of that, sit the other two categories that sustainable development goals fall into, the society and economy categories. But within those, we have to keep in mind the planetary boundaries that we're operating within. When we don't want to take action for economy, it's going to have a negative impact on society or a negative impact on the biosphere. And so that's an easier way to look at the sustainable development goals and how they relate to the work of the biosphere reserves. So biosphere reserves have been brought into line with these sustainable development goals. So of course, the main concern is nature conservation, but we're always interlinking with these other areas of economy and society as well. And to help us achieve that, the Man of the Biosphere program have created this lovely schematic of how a biosphere reserve can be organized. So each biosphere reserve has three set zones. The core area, which is here, this green spot in the center, this is always a protected area. So the main concern in this area is nature conservation. When we step outside into the blue zone here, we start to see a lot more human activity. And this is where we see a lot of what we call cultural landscapes. So there's a big interplay between how people are using this area and the ecology of the area. And then outside of that again, the lighter blue area, we have what's called the transition zone. And that's where we start to see a lot of our sustainable development, a lot of our economy and a lot of our actions as a society. So the biosphere reserves are focused under three sort of pillars of action, nature conservation, sustainable development, and research and learning. They're described by UNESCO as learning places for sustainable development. And now you've had a whistle stop tour of the sustainable development goals. I hope you have a nice picture of what that can look like. So what are the benefits? And this is a question I've asked a lot. What's the point of trying to do all of this work? Well, there are many benefits that can be, uh, can be seen in biosphere areas um, in terms of the environmental, economic, and social sustainability. It encourages diverse local communities. There are learning sites to help explore and demonstrate approaches to conservation and sustainable development. And they highlight the distinctiveness of the area and help foster a sense of place. And I feel like that's very important here in Kerry. We're all so proud of the fact that we're from Kerry. And we're very proud of the fact of the, the habitats and the species that we have here. And the biosphere really highlights that on a global stage, that this is a significant area for those things. I'm getting some really fancy lighting here. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said before, worldwide, we have 727 UNESCO biosphere reserves. But there are only two in Ireland so far. So we have the Dublin Bay Biosphere Reserve, which is over on the East Coast, as you all know, and us here in Kerry, down in the Southwest. Now, there are a few other areas that are looking at implementing a biosphere reserve within Ireland, but they're not there yet. So hopefully in the future, we'll see that number grow. So finally, to Kerry. And here is a map of the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. There are some over on the table. If you want to take one home with you, you're more than welcome. So if we cast our minds back to that picture we saw of the three different zones of a biosphere, 
Now we're seeing it in a real world context. So not every biosphere globally looks exactly the same. It's very specific to the area in which it's situated. It looks at the ecology of that area, the hydrography, and it tries to look at incorporating, <coughs> excuse me, incorporating areas that are going to help promote the conservation of that site. So our core area is at Clarendon National Park here. Now you'll notice up here at the top, it says first designated in 1982. So in Kerry, we've actually had a biosphere for almost 40 years. Now with the evolving conversation around sustainable development, the first generation of biospheres that were designated had a smaller requirement for their actions. And so the first biosphere in Kerry was actually the Killarney National Park Biosphere, which is this area here, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. It now forms the core area of the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. So after the review process in 2017, the partnership between South Kerry Development, Kerry County Council, and the MBWS emerged to meet the new criteria for biosphere reserves set by the Seville Conference in the Valley Biosphere Program. And this is why our biosphere looks like this today. So our core area, as I said, is this red section here, Kalani National Park, and the earth box section there. And then the brown section here, or orange, depending on how colorblind I am today, um, that is what we call the buffer zone. And again, this is where we start to see our cultural landscapes and a lot of human activity happening, but hopefully in a sustainable way. These are also protected areas. So we know Kalani National Park is a protected area. There's also special areas of conservation and SPAs around these areas as well. And then when we come out into the transition zone here, this is the green section that you see around it. That's where we're looking at that term, sustainable development, and trying to encourage our communities to take action towards it. So what have we been doing for the year in the biosphere reserve? It's not just been me sat at home in my spare room on the laptop, I promise. We've got a few things done. We first started looking at priority actions and what we could do. And to do that, we sort of looked under the three pillars of action for biosphere reserve. Initially, of course, education and research requires some kind of communication and engagement. And so one of the first things we did was look at setting up our communication channels with social media, a website, uh, and getting the office space as well. And then we started working on engagement. Now that's been online, of course, for the year, but we'll start doing some more like this in person events. Hopefully in the not too distant future, this will be the norm again. We've also been looking at conservation, and I suppose you can't really spend any time in Kerry. I know I'm from Cahill and Daniel, and when I drive to the office in Beaufort, regardless of whether I go over Malls Gap into Clarny or around through Clorden, there is rhododendron on either side of the road in many places. So you can't ignore the invasive species issue in the area. Uh, we've worked closely with the McGillicuddy Reeds project, um, and we're also looking at upland fire management, which is a program we're hoping to start addressing next year. And then of course, sustainable development. So we've done some work around sustainable tourism, and again, we're looking at engaging with our providers. A lot of the initial research that we've done in that area has shown that in Kerry, we actually have a huge number of businesses and communities that are already engaged in sustainable or conservation actions. So really what we're trying to do is find out where they are, who they are, and how we can best support them, rather than trying to come in with, you know, reinventing the wheel. So you can check out our lovely website, www.kerrybiosphere.ie and you can find us on social media channels. We're actually live on Facebook right now, so if anyone can see us, drop a lovely comment. Um, we're on Instagram and we're on Twitter, so you'll find us with the at Kerry Biosphere. So what else have we been doing? So anyone who's really good at maths will have noted that the Man in the Biosphere program started in 1971, and since we're in 2021 this year, it is the 50th year anniversary of the UNESCO Man in the Biosphere program. And so in celebration of this, we've been collaborating with two other biosphere reserves, the Dublin Bay Biosphere and the Isle of Man Biosphere, our two closest geographical neighbours. And this has been a year-long project of monthly webinars to celebrate the natural and cultural heritage of various areas within our biosphere reserves. So there's a lot of topics, as you can see, that overlap, like birds, marine mammals, maybe not for a carry, um, not the biosphere anyways, we're a mountain biosphere, not a coastal one. Um, and then the flowers of the Dublin Bay, and we followed that with plants of Kerry. We have another one upcoming in November, later this month, and that will focus on the birds of the Kerry Biosphere as well, so keep an eye out for that. We've also tried to get in touch with as many primary school students as possible. Um, a lot of this was done online, given the restrictions that we've been living under. And so in March and May, we collaborated with Dublin Bay Biosphere, and we hosted these series of online talks 
focused on nature connection and nature activities for our students between first and sixth class. And as you can see, we had a huge number of attendees for these. Um, so it was quite a significant impact on the, the knowledge of, of primary school students. Now locally in Kerry, we've been very fortunate to have the support from the Creative Ireland Kerry program to run this Our Planet, Your Biosphere event series. We had that in 2020 and we've given it as again in 2021. So this is the second um, event series that we've hosted with this series of funding. And that included online talks, schools activities, and the Mind Kerry Biosphere pro pro project as well, which developed a calendar, which there's a few here today that you can take a look at. As part of this, with the school's activities, we hosted a webinar with Shane Casey, who is an author of a children's book that focuses on using um, real attributes from animals to tell the story. And for that webinar, we had over 300 primary schools in Ireland attend, which represents 10% of the schools in Ireland. So there's a huge interest in this kind of um, educational and awareness activities. So we plan to keep it going into the future, even if it does mean staying on Zoom for a little bit longer. <laughs> So back to what we do, nature conservation, sustainable development, research and learning. We're going to focus in now a little bit on the nature conservation side of things and some of the work that we've done so far, specifically around the topic that we're here to talk about today. Last year in 2020, we hosted two online community talks with the REED CIP project and Tim Callan from the NPWS to share some of the information that they had about how to best treat it, how to identify it, and how to start managing it within your own local areas. We also created a video demonstration that you're going to see later, and we funded some mapping of rhododendron stands within the REITS EIP area. This year, <clears throat> we've been fortunate enough to have more funding from the National Biodiversity Action Plan to continue this work, and this conference is part of this project as well. So over the summer, we had a social media campaign to increase awareness and encourage people to identify rhododendron and begin to map it using the National Biodiversity Data Center app. So this was a citizen science project and we had a really good response. And then following on from that is the conference today where we're trying to share the learnings. So this is a map that we took from the National Biodiversity Data Center website in July showing the existing records of rhododendron then from 2013 to 2021. So as you can see, there's been a lot of mapping happening here, a little bit down around here, and a little along the top, and a little bit over here as well. But I think if anyone recognizes rhododendron and can spot it as you're driving past, there's a huge amount of it around here, and there's a huge amount of it around the Kenmare area here, from if you drive from Sneem to Kenmare. So obviously the citizen science hasn't completely covered the area yet. And then when we zoom out and look at Ireland and the coverage, this is a map taken from the National Biodiversity Data Center um, last night. So this is the up-to-date records that they have. And there's rhododendron to be found in all areas. So as much as we're looking at this in the context of Kerry and the Kerry biosphere, and we talk a lot about the national park and the work that they're doing, this is a national issue that we're facing. And it has global impacts in terms of the sustainable development goals that we heard about earlier. So as you can see with citizen science, this is the records um, across all the data sets over the years. So there has been records back as far as 1958. Now there's obviously been rhododendron for longer. These are just the records that the data center has access to. But you can see from 1990, there's definitely an increase in awareness of the issue with rhododendron and it's being mapped more. And this one is interesting, I suppose, because we see this a lot. Everyone says they love the purple flowers. And this gives a good indication of how easy it is to identify rhododendron when it's in flower. So it flowers over the summer months here. And this is where you see the spike in the, the records going into the data center. So thank you all so much for listening to me waffle on about the biosphere and rhododendron. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy the rest of the talks later today. And if you have any questions, of course, you can find me afterwards or in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. And my thanks to Eleanor Turner there, the Biosphere Officer uh, with the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere. And I think we all learned an awful lot about the biosphere. And it's safe to say, Eleanor, that the pandemic hasn't stopped the hard work that you have been doing virtually and no doubt once Hopefully this pandemic calms down, you'll be able to do a lot more in-person events just like this one.
and uh, you looked great in the, the new lighting that we have, and I have to uh, give uh, some credit to Valerie O'Sullivan, who you'll see going around with a camera, and also I forgot to mention at the start that beautiful video with those gorgeous images around Killarney were, of course, courtesy of Valerie O'Sullivan, our, one of our best photographers, uh, award-winning photographers in this country. Anyway, it is time for a quick cup of tea or coffee, whichever takes your fancy, and we'll be uh, back after that with uh, more speakers. Thank you. Now, next up, we are very, very lucky to be joined by an expert, uh, Dr. Therese Higgins. Now, she's a dog, we won't hold that against her. We'll call her an adopted Kerry woman. We're not talking about football today, so it's okay. It's all about rhododendron. And she is an experienced ecologist with over 20 years in the field, is currently a lecturer at the Munster Technological University and has been lecturing uh, there, I suppose, since the days of IT Trilly as well in wildlife biology, the degree that's offered through MTU as well. And she supervises master's research. Taking back the clock a little bit first, Trace, I hope you won't mind. Uh, she graduated from Trinity College in Dublin with an honours degree in natural sciences specialising in botany and uh, she undertook a PhD on natural regeneration in native woodlands as well. She's a self-employed ecological consultant too and uh, she's a strong interest in invasive species luckily for us today because she's going to take us through a presentation which I think as you can see the title is so apt, The Beauty and the Beast, because as we know rhododendron with those beautiful purple flowers, it's a very striking plant, but as we're also well aware it's doing serious damage to our native habitats in this country as well. Also Dr Higgins founded the Kerry branch of the Botanical Society of Ireland and Britain as well. And I'll hand over to you Trace, no further ado, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Can you all hear me? Um, those of you, and I see many of my former students in the room, hi lads. Um, I think I saw any ladies. I tend to move around when I speak, so will somebody annoy me if you can't hear me at the back? I, I do it unconsciously, so I hope it'll work. Um, I kind of just want to debunk that this is a notion of expert. I don't really consider myself an expert. Um, I am really passionate about wildlife, about the earth, the planet. Um, my particular personal passion is plants, but I like other living things too. Um, but I suppose I have been a long time listening, learning, reading, wondering, asking about invasive species in general and rhododendron in particular. Um, so what I'm going to tell you today really doesn't belong to me um, in that it's information I've gathered from physical work as a ground worker, like Bach and Linden before me. Um, and under the instruction, I suppose, of people that have been doing it long before me and some of those are in this room. Um, and then bringing my mind to it, I suppose, whatever that's worth, um, with my background, uh, which is primarily in woodlands, I'm particularly interested in woodland regeneration and I don't know whether other people in the room realise but our woodlands in certain parts of the country are not regenerating and why and, and what to do about that. Um, so anyway, so, so that's just to say, I, I don't really consider myself an expert, so I, I have my opinions on things, I read and I find as much evidence as I can, and I'm going to share that with you, but I think there's other people in the room who have strengths uh, there as well. So yes, as Ashton said, the beauty and the beast, um, both in the one, it's a beautiful plant, um, and we're going to talk more about it, but before we do, I want to talk a little bit about ourselves, Homo sapien, the wise man. Uh, is the, the scientific name given to our species. And we're only one of an estimated 1.3 million species on the planet. That's the best guess estimate at the minute. And um, it's crunch time for us. Um, when I was about 11, Antashka came to my primary school and showed us a video much like Valerie's uh, beautiful opening video with music in the background and made us cry. Mm -hmm. And in those days, it was the mid-1980s, the big worries were nuclear power, um, acid rain and the ozone layer. Um, but it started off a kind of a passion in me and a worry in me, I suppose, that made me want to know more. Why? What's going to happen to us? Are we all going to die? Is the world going to end? Interesting questions I'm answering that I'm getting from my own children today. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been, uh, I, I've done my Bachelor of Sciences degree, I've done my PhD, I've worked as an ecological consultant and still do a little bit of that, but in the main I'm a teacher these days um, in MTU. 
And the two modules I teach, which are probably closest to my heart in terms of where I feel I make a difference, uh, not the easiest ones because they change every three seconds, um, are biodiversity and conservation. And we teach those to our fourth years. And they're really about standing back and looking at the planet and where is it at as a whole, um, the troubles that it faces, and what can we do about it. Um, and I have to be hopeful because literally we teach, I teach biodiversity at the moment, my fourth years, and I'm literally bringing them in chocolate. Because when we look at the figures, it's that bad. It's actually depressing, really depressing. And we hear a lot about climate anxiety. The same applies um, um, to the biodiversity crisis. So if we look um, at this graphic here, it's taken from the Living Planet report from 2016, a couple of years ago. And um, what that report was summarizing was studies um, over 40 years, from about 1971, um, of 20,000 populations. So a population is a, a, a a herd of deer, so a group of species of their animals or plants that, that live and get on together and it might be red squirrels here but that would be a different population to red squirrels in England for example, okay, so that's what the population is. And 20,000 of those over, what was it, 4,300 and more species were studied over the 40 years of this, that this report scanned and they found that the size of the average population across the world of wild species had declined by 68%. Okay, so a lot of species, wild species that the planet depends on, that make up this big ecosystem, Gaia, that we're all dependent on, shrinking in their numbers. When we take that further and we look at what the IUCN Red List does, it assesses species one by one, takes all the information on board about them, including their population sizes, their ranges, what threats they face, what kind of solution actions are happening. And of the 138 species that are assessed so far, more than 38 and a half thousand of those are in an extinction class. Okay, they're threatened with extinction within the next um, either three generations or 50 years. Okay, and you can just see an example there of the, the different groups. Amphibians are very highly threatened, 41%. And what's driving all this? Well, the hard truth is that we are. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kind of bonkers, I'm not wild uh, about this. Extinction is something that has always happened on this planet. Of all the organisms we know that have survived, 98% of them now no longer are with us. The average taxon only persists on this planet for between 1 and 10 million years. Okay, so we all come, something better comes along, and it goes again. It's a bit like uh, tapes. Remember tapes? And then mini discs, and then CDs, and now it's your phone. Okay, and that's, that's how nature works, that's how the planet evolves. Um, but at the moment, uh, our species, our single species among all those, is having a massive impact on the planet. We're hearing a lot about it in the context of climate change, which I'll, I'll come back to, um, but it's also true for biodiversity, uh, for those, those figures there. And there's five drivers, kind of fueled by humans, the number of humans and the lifestyles of humans um, that are, are driving all of this. The, the top one, and the one that's probably been, well, along with one other, been the most long in terms of its impact is habitat destruction, where we change um, the land from being what was wild and what was nature to something else. So in Ireland, it's mostly farmland, um, but also forestry, also cities and towns, also gardens, okay, where we want to take control, and it's a natural thing to do, it's an instinctive thing that we do as humans, um, but I suppose what we have to remember is that when we do it, we're obliterating the wild nature that was there in the first place. The second is climate change, I'm not going to say too much about it, except that we have absolutely caused it. Yes, it has changed before, not at this pace. And I suppose the message for me about climate change is that, you know what, biodiversity will suffer, but biodiversity will bounce back. It's my children and their children if they have them, and I don't know if I want them to, uh, and your children and your grandchildren that are gonna to have to live with face. And for us, it would be inconvenient. There'll be floods, there'll be increase in food prices, there'll be uh, food security issues, there'll be supply issues. It'd be very inconvenient for people living in coastal areas like Maharese, um, their homes will probably be underwater if they're not blown away by the winds and storms first uh, and same for many other places around the world and uh, then for the people who have least secure access to food and safe living you know they're already seeing this they're already suffering in a, in a big big way for this so we're going to see a lot more refugee crises um, because of climate change if we don't do something about it pretty quick invasive species then is the third on my list and interestingly invasive species are the second kind of most important currently um, after habitat change in terms of what has caused biodiversity loss up to now. Most of that biodiversity loss has been on islands 
because if an invasive species arrives in an island, the native species have nowhere else to go. They can't pop over to the, to the land next door. But they, they do play a role um, in our habitats too, which I will obviously get onto. Um, direct exploitation, these are layers of cause. Uh, very few of them left in the wild, very popular among collectors, but so, so rare now that at one point in the last couple of years, gram for gram, they've been worth the same amount on the streets of New York as a gram of heroin. Okay, so there's big business in that. Other forms of exploitation are where we overfish, uh, where we overharvest wood from wild populations, um, where we collect eggs uh, for a craze where we collect ferns, like the Cloudy Fern would have been overcollected. And of course, most of these things are being done unconsciously. It's not that people are really trying to wreck their planet and doom their future. Um, but nonetheless, we are doing it almost blindly in some cases um, as a society. And then finally, I just mentioned pollution. And I'll talk about pollution again at the end in the context of rhododendron. Um, the author of my thought is sitting down the back. Um, but pollution, you know, we're all aware of pollution in terms of oil spills or chemical spills, and they tend to have a fairly local impact which on top of all the other threats that biodiversity face is, is, is difficult. Um, probably the most scary pollution at the moment is our introduction of nutrients into the wild, phosphates and nitrates, um, because they are they're homogenizing the landscape and the species that survive in the special places that don't have lots of nutrients in them um, can only survive there. And when we're making those places more like everywhere else, the thugs uh, get in and they've lost their, their niche. So when we look at this, this is a graphic, it's quite old now, but it still applies today. It's from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment of 2005. And what it's doing is, if you look across the top, it's a little bit small, uh, habitat change, climate change, invasive species, overexploitation, and pollution are these five human drivers, if you like, of biodiversity loss. And what it then does is down the side, it breaks up the, the habitats of the world on a growth scale, looking over the entire planet, um, into their different ecotypes of forests, for example, they invite into boreal, temperate, tropical, and so on. And the colour, the darker the colour, the redder the colour, the more affected that habitat type has been by the particular driver. So you see in red, the tropical forests and uh, the temperate grasslands, the, the inland waters, for example, are already very damaged. They're already in a bad state globally because of these particular drivers. And then the direction of the arrow is telling you, well, what's, what's the trend? Are things getting better or are things getting worse? And if you look um, for invasive species, well, for climate change, they're all getting worse because it's, it's, it's a runaway horse that we're trying to catch. Um, and for invasive species in most habitats, uh, well, in a lot of habitats, they're increasing. Uh, it's stable in some others, but the damage is already done, for example, there on island populations. So it's just to kind of bring all of this together and realize that when we talk about rhododendron, it's part of a really big picture. And I might be upset and worry at night about clearings in the rainforest or the melting of the ice caps. And it's not that there's nothing I can do about that. But actually, as a citizen of Ireland, and at the moment, Kerry, and thank you for having me, um, you know, there's things under my nose, there's things on my doorstep that I can do. And I really feel it incumbent on me to let the other people around me know that there's things on their doorstep that they can do. And they will all help to, to fix this jigsaw that's a little bit bashed at the moment. So I'm actually going to shut up for a minute. I'm going to pass you over to a wise man who's talking about climate change. And, um, and he is genuinely a wise man, not just an ordinary homo sapiens. Um, because I feel his message is very real and very relevant. Before I just dig into the, the nitty gritty of Rodo, um, I'd like you to hear him, my apologies if you've already uh, experienced this, but it's worth watching. I think this will be my sixth time. Nope, wrong one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I think you know who he is. To spend the next two weeks debating, negotiating, persuading, and compromising, as you surely must, it's easy to forget that ultimately the emergency climate comes down to a single number. <clears throat> the concentration of carbon in our atmosphere, the measure that greatly determines global temperature. And the changes in that one number is the clearest way to chart our own story, for it defines our relationship with our world. For much of humanity's ancient history, that number bounced wildly between 180 and 300. And so too did global temperatures. It was 
a brutal and unpredictable world. At times, our ancestors existed only in tiny numbers. But just over 10,000 years ago, that number suddenly stabilized. And with it, Earth's climate. We found ourselves in an unusually benign period with predictable seasons and reliable weather. For the first time, civilization was possible and we wasted no time in taking advantage of that. Everything we've achieved in the last 10,000 years was enabled by the stability during this time. The global temperature has not wavered over this period by more than plus or minus one degree Celsius. Until now, one burning of fossil our burning of fossil fuels, our destruction of nature, our approach to industry, construction and learning, our releasing carbon into the atmosphere at an unprecedented pace and scale. We are already in trouble. The stability we all depend on is breaking. This story is one of inequality as well as instability. Today, those who've done the least to cause this problem are being the hardest hit. Ultimately, all of us will feel the impact, some of which are now unavoidable. My world is melting. We think you have control. We actually have no control. I'm absolutely terrified to bring a child to this world. Is this how our story is due to end? A tale of the smartest species doomed by that auto-human characteristic of failing to see the bigger picture in pursuit of short-term goals. Perhaps the fact that the people most affected by climate change are no longer some imagined future generation, but young people alive today, perhaps that will give us the impetus we need to rewrite our story, to turn this tragedy into a triumph we are, after all, the greatest problem solvers to have ever existed on Earth. We now understand this problem. We know how to stop the number rising and put it in reverse. We must have carbon emissions halt them this decade. We must recapture billions of tons of carbon from the air. We must fix our sights of keeping one and a half degrees within reach. A new industrial revolution powered by millions of sustainable innovations is essential and is indeed already beginning. We will all share in the benefits. Affordable clean energy, healthy air, and enough food to sustain us all. Nature is a key ally. Whenever we restore the wild, it will recapture carbon and help us bring back balance to our planet. And as we work to build a better world, we must acknowledge no nation has completed its development because no advanced nation is yet sustainable. All have a journey still to complete so that all nations have a good standard of living and a modest footprint. We may have to learn together how to achieve this, ensuring none are left behind. We must use this opportunity to create a more equal world. And our motivation should not be fear, but hope. Can we fix climate problem in one generation? My answer would be yes. 
we have to really to not just to talk about what we can do, but to do what we can. This is a challenge that we should try to solve in a quick way with a long term vision. It comes down to this. The people alive now of the generation to come will look at this conference and consider one thing. Did that number stop rising and start to drop as a result of commitments made here? There's every reason to believe that the answer can be yes. If working apart, we are a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. In my lifetime, I witnessed a terrible decline. In yours, you could and should witness a wonderful recovery. That desperate hope, ladies and gentlemen, delegates, excellencies, is why the world is looking to you and why you are here. Thank you. to all of the five drivers, not just to climate change. And while Attenborough was talking to the world leaders, to Elon Musk, to the other rich fella, who I can never remember who he is, you know, big tech, they're coming on board, I feel hope for the first time in my, I don't want to say how old you are, but my probably 20 years of learning to understand how the world works. And it's complicated, we're waiting for somebody else to do something a lot of the time, and that's necessary because we can't do it on our own, but there is stuff we can do. Um, and that's kind of, that's just my philosophy on it. And, and I think that needs to be applied to, to rhododendron and other invasive species just as much as, as climate change. Okay, so I'll stop with the philosophy and I'll move on to um, avian invasive species and what they are. So I just want to clear up a little bit of terminology before I begin. Um, because there can be a bit of confusion out there and when we're not all clear what we mean, we can not be on the same page as each other and sometimes that, that's not helpful. So the, the concept of alien invasive species involves the idea of native versus, not, versus non-native. So things are native, we tend to accept them, we like them, um, they've evolved with the species around them, uh, there's a bit of a balance there, usually. Uh, that said, we do have invasive native species, think about bracken, think about um, nettles in some instances, think about bramble in some instances, you know, where they can smother out the vegetation. But in terms of non-native species, um, it's things that have arrived here not on their own, but with human assistance. So in Ireland's case, it tends to be in the last 6,000 years or so that we, we think about uh, species being um, alien. Um, not all aliens are invasive, and that's really important to recognise but at the same time, it's really important to keep an eye on things because ecology and ecosystems are dynamic. Okay, as we change management, uh, the parameters shift under which species are surviving or thriving or failing, uh, such as climate change is going to cause. Um, and also as management shifts, things become more and less um, able to get in or able to be invaded. So we need to keep an eye on that, but it is important to recognise it. And then just other terms that you often see in invasive species literature, the words pest, the word nuisance, and it's not that invasives aren't pests or nuisance, but some things, sometimes things can be a pest without being an invasive species, so just to be conscious of that. So I tend to use the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, definition of alien invasive species when I'm coming at it from a conservation space, which is generally where I'm at. Um, and they define uh, an alien invasive species as one which becomes established in a natural or semi-natural ecosystem or habitat and is an agent of change and threatens native biological diversity. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at species that have an impact on biodiversity. Now that's not to say that they don't have economic impacts on our touch on that, and of course they do, and impacts on livelihoods, and impact on communities and societies. But from the, the conservation science space, this is one of the primary uh, focuses. And globally, we know that 801 species of plant and animal have become extinct since 1500. That's what we know. I'm sure there's plenty more. Um, and three quarters of them are attached 
to the three drivers of habitat and over-exploitation, so directly taking things out of the wild by hunting, for example, um, by habitat destruction, I should have said, and also by invasive species. It's this huge driver of extinction on islands like Hawaii, for example, where something like three quarters of the plants and animals that you see are not native there. Um, so we have lots of data, and Eleanor touched on the importance of recording in citizen science, and I'd echo her thoughts on that. Um, and there's this particular uh, programme, DAISY, which is delivering alien invasive species inventories for Europe. And it tells us that we've had more than 45,000 invasion um, events documented in, in Europe. Um, and when you look at those, they're made up of 10,677 different species, 60% of which are plants. Um, but they also calculate, looking at them, that only about 15% of them cause biological damage, and 15% of them also cause economic damage, and there's some overlap uh, in that, of course. So not every non-native um, is going to, to, to cause a problem. That said, the species which are invasive are rising dramatically, both in their number and in their impact, with a 37% increase since 1970 of the number of invasives that are recognised within Europe. So it's, it's a problem now, it's been a problem for some time, but it's a growing problem. In Ireland then, we know that we have about uh, 1,280 non-native species and possibly more, probably more. Um, and the National Biodiversity Data Centre, again, which I refer to, um, assessed these in 2008. I think they assessed 377 of them, of the ones most likely to be problematic or thought to be problematic, and categorised 13% of those as uh, high risk, as, as invasive at all, sorry, excuse me. Um, the high risk ones, the likes of rhododendron, also knotweed, um, cherry laurel, etc., uh, made up 48, um, percent, which is 13% uh, of those 377, and a further 21% were medium uh, impact invasives, such as clematis. And again, medium impact is to do with both the, the, the severity of what it does to an ecosystem when it gets in and also its extent. So locally, I know I've had experience in the park where clematis has gotten out of hand in the U-woods way back. I don't know if Peter is here. Um, but the, the, the vines of it grew so, so thickly that deer antlers were getting caught up in it. And I know a couple of deer had to be euthanized um, because they were stuck and, and in pain and, and unable to get out. So local impacts rather than big, complete um, ecosystem changing uh, impacts. And then you've got the medium impact uh, invasives such as uh, ground elder here. And this is one that's creeping up my road uh, near Baradov uh, in East Kerry at the moment, um, associated with people putting their lawn clippings on the side of the road instead of composting them. So they're adding nitrogen or phosphate to the side of the road, which is kind of some of our last native grasslands. Um, and that's facilitating these nitrogen hungry, aggressive competitors to, to get very happy indeed. Um, and so I suppose what I'm trying to show you there is that the way in which invasives impact um, are many um, and often complicated and often complicated by lots of other outside seemingly harmless factors. You know, most people don't think that they're chicken, chicken their chicken to their garden into nature is any problem at all. And in fact, it can be. So back to rhododendron then, the beauty of the beast, as I said, it is a beautiful thing. I am, when I finally get to talk about it, going to tell you a little bit about its background, how it got here, its ecology, briefly speak about its ecological and economic impacts, talk about how it invades, why it invades, where it invades, and finally get around to talking about management. Now I'm only going to talk about management in, in terms of principles, in terms of methods, how to do it, um, and also approaches, uh, principles of approach to management. Um, and I suppose I'm informed by my own experiences here in the park, both with groundwork, ground uh, as an ecologist working on various surveys, uh, later on a contract to, to go around the country and see how have rhododendron been managed in uh, our MPWS sites over the years and also through quite a lot of engagement with um, the forest research uh, part of the forestry commission in Scotland and UK and with Snowdonia National Park so they're kind of where my main uh, information is coming from. So rhododendron of course um, is only, rhododendron pontum is only one species of more than a thousand and it's closely related to our arbutus, our strawberry tree, to our native heathers and so on. It's a member of the, the heather family. Um, and they're beautiful, beautiful plants. Anyone who's been to any of the gardens um, in the spring or summer, Doreen Gardens, for example, Muckers Gardens, they really are stunning um, plants. And around the world, 
they occupy lots of different habitats. This is kind of the smallest one, a little um, alpine species here, uh, native to the middle of Europe. This is Nepal, the Himalaya, where it's probably some of the biggest diversity of rhododendrons. And in fact, this particular rhododendron is Nepal's native flower. And then this is not in its native habitat, it's in a garden in Cornwall, but you know, some of them are, are trees and forming a, you know, quite a diverse ecosystem where they are native. And if you look at the distribution of the genus, so that's all the different species of rhododendron together around the world, you'll see they're very much a northern hemisphere lot. And in fact, they were more widespread in the past, previous to the current warm spell that we're in. We had an ice, well, we're in an ice age, we had a glacial period. And before that glacial period, we know that we had rhododendron ponds come on these islands. Okay, but it didn't, didn't come back afterwards until, until we brought it. Um, but it's sometimes an argument you hear from people against uh, why they should manage it. So in terms of Britain and Ireland, uh, the first rhododendrons, I'm talking about the genus there, were brought in the early 1600s by uh, Huguenot refugees fleeing persecution. And that was this little alpine plant here, uh, rhododendron here, Sutum. It's very small, it didn't really take off as, as being particularly popular. Didn't try and get out of the garden in which it was planted. So it was, it, it was an alien but a non-invasive. The next one that we know was introduced with rhododendron maximum from North America as early as 1736. And this was a much bigger thing with a big showier flower. So this became very popular. And after this, a whole suite of species of rhododendron came in that are big and bushy, brightly different colored flowers. And they really became very, very popular. And you have to think about what was going on at this time. Christopher Columbus had discovered the world's far away. Um, the age of exploration was truly in full swing. And we realized that actually there were more creatures or plants in the world than Bishop Upper, Usher said that there were. Okay, so it's around this time that the ideas around evolution and diversity were starting to come out as well. And as we have to think about the society of the day, people were very religious, they believed in God fervently and had to, because life was pretty miserable for most of them. Even if you were rich and well to do, you tended to lose a lot of your children before they, they reached adulthood. So you had, kind of had to cling on to the next life theory to stay sane. And, um, and, and with that, there were a lot of fixed ideas about climate and about species and, and what existed and that God put them there in those seven days. So when, when Columbus started finding all these extra things that weren't going to have fitted in the ark, of course, questions had to be asked. But in any case, that's what they did. And for people that had the money and had the space and had the resources, it was very, very fashionable to collect these. And of course, the Victorians were particularly good at this because they were also engineers, they were innovators, and they found ways to make things live uh, in Britain in particular, and also in Ireland, that wouldn't have really survived uh, otherwise through hot housing and, and so on. So Ponticum itself um, was first described to science uh, by a uh, Frenchman, Joseph Piton de Tunefort, um, and it was new Linnaeus, who was the great kind of recorder, the great citizen scientist uh, of our time, of that time, um, named it Ponticum because uh, the two and four had found it uh, on the Pontic Sea, uh, on the Pontus area of the Black Sea, and so he named it the Rhododendron Ponticum. But it kind of stayed there at that point, there wasn't a whole lot of, of shift from, from that particular direction at the time, but it wasn't until uh, sometime later in 1750 when another student of Linnaeus, uh, Baron Klaas Astro, a, a Swede as well, uh, discovered it in Spain. And it's quite interesting because if you look at the native distribution of Rhododendron today, um, you've got that triangle is kind of telling you a lie. There's a more true picture in a minute, but this is the range, okay? So it occurs right down at the southern tip of Spain, in the middle of Portugal, a little bit in north Portugal, and then it also occurs in this original Pontic area uh, in Eastern Europe. But in fact, we know now that there are two distinct subspecies. Now they can interbreed, lots of plants don't like to obey the laws of what we humans think they should be doing in terms of species, and they, they mix a lot. Uh, and rhododendrons are, are some of those, which is also probably added to our problem today. Um, so if you look more closely at that distribution, then um, the native distribution is in green again, and so you can hardly see the populations uh, of Iberia. And it's ironic, and I'll slide from them later, there's actually a life project in Iberia trying to save rhododendron ponticum, um, because it's a relic species there, and it's threatened by all sorts of things that a lot of our native species are threatened by here. Um, but what you'll see here is that it has naturalized uh, throughout France and is particularly problematic in Belgium, the Netherlands, Britain and Ireland, uh, as we all know. So the individual responsible for bringing rhododendron ponticum to Britain then was neither Astrum nor uh, de Tunefort. It was actually this guy, Conrad Lodges, and he was a Dutchman who, no he wasn't, he was a German who trained in Holland, uh, interested in plants, a head gardener, um, but he was really interested in all these exciting things, because he just got very excited about new and pretty things. 
And so he set up himself as, as a trader in, in London and he was making a lot of money out of the fact that people wanted all these exotic, exciting things. Uh, among the things he brought were rhubarb, to which I'm very grateful for him because rhubarb gin is my favourite. <laughs> Um, but he also brought old gender ponds and he did that in, in 1763 and it was just seed that came initially um, but as we know to our, our, our dismay here the seed grows very very well. So in Ireland it had arrived by about 1800, we don't have an exact date or an exact place um, but it was being recorded in the wild by at least 1894 and probably earlier if, 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 we're, if we're right. So how did it do this? How did it jump from a pack of seeds in London to the big thunk problem that we have today? Well, it was very much prized for its ornamental value. It was planted in parks and in gardens initially. Um, and it soon became known to the people that were trying to establish all these pretty things in gardens that it was a very hardy species of rhododendron. So a lot of the rhododendrons that are very pretty don't tolerate our weather terribly well. But Pontecum was perfect in Britain. So they would have used it as, as a, a rootstock, much like we do for apples, but which to graft less hardy species and not allow those less hardy species to do their thing and look lovely. The difficulty with that is that when you stop managing that, um, eventually the rootstock genes will take over and it will shoot up its, its own uh, branches and smother away uh, the other individual from, from the equation. Possibly, uh, very much importantly uh, for us in terms of rhododendron jumping into the wild, it was very useful for game cover. It grows very quickly, it forms a very dense thicket. So again, if you're thinking back to the times that were in the 1700s, hunting was the, the golf of the wealthy and those that had time on their hands and so they needed animals to hunt and to have animals to hunt, you needed to breed them in high densities. And so planting for game, whether it was for foxes, for pheasant, uh, ironically, uh, for deer, it was planted for both helps. Um, you know, this, this was something that was done on a large scale up and down Britain and Ireland. Um, in some places, and I see them locally to me uh, near Rathmore, you know, it was planted for shelter because it's quite tolerant um, of winds and miserable conditions and low amounts of sunshine. It won't necessarily give you lots of flowers, um, but it'll give you lovely protection and keep your little house warm um, if, if that's what you need. So it would have also been planted as shelter belt. So, I suppose the take home stories, it was widely planted on estates and domains in particular, but not exclusively. Um, and as far as I know, it's still sold in garden centres today. I wasn't going to get into the law very much, um, there are regulations, but uh, as far as I know, that is the case. It certainly was until a few years ago. So, what about it? It's very much a broad leaved and very multi stemmed bush, um, and these are characters that impact um, how it affects ecosystems and also the challenges that it provides to us in terms of managing it. Uh, the leaves are evergreen, so it's green all year round, and they're very waxy. And that waxiness means that they reflect light uh, very well, they resist drought fairly well, um, and, uh, and when we come to talk about it later, they don't suck up uh, herbicides terribly easily. It typically grows to between two and four metres tall, um, shorter obviously, if it's in an open habitat, where it's not having to compete with taller things for light, but I've seen uh, stems, virgin stems, more than six metres in length uh, in Oakwoods in Killarney in my time. Um, and they tend to be leaning on the trees, but they will, they will get up there. And it really thrives on humid acidic soils. They, this idea of humid soils is very important. So they're not soils that are waterlogged, okay? Because the, all the tissues of plants, like all the tissues of you and I need oxygen. Okay, we're all aerobes. And, um, the root tissues also need oxygen in most plants, and they get that from the soil. Okay, a, a fairly standard garden soil is about 25% air, and that air has oxygen in it. When that soil becomes waterlogged, it squeezes out the air, and there's no oxygen there, and that's why a lot of our plants die if we overwater them, or, or why lots of things won't grow in wet places. So rhododendron doesn't really like the wet places. Okay, but it does like a lot of humidity. It likes a lot of moisture, more so in the air. Um, it can be very long lived for at least 130 years and that's going on the basis of some of the earliest introduced things and that's how old they are because they haven't died yet. So we don't really know, but it's, it's, it's potentially <laughs> much, much older than that. Um, another thing to add to our woes and that unlike its cousin, which people are familiar with, it, the, the cherry laurel, it's a really copious seed producer. And in optimal conditions where it's very happy with its substrate, with its climate, um, it will produce those seeds annually from a fairly young age. 
It can layer in very wet sites. Now, I personally haven't been to a lot of places, have only seen this once, um, but it's where the, the, the branches of it, um, when they're in enough contact with damp ground for long enough, can put down little roots. Cherry laurel is far more likely to do it, and I wonder whether a lot of the reports in the literature about layering is confusing cherry laurel with rhododendron, because I'm not really convinced about that one. Um, and so what's happened anyway in the hundred and so years since it was introduced is that it's escaped, it's invaded acid soils, especially where the climate is mild and moist. And the reason why it's so, so such a talk, so successful on, on these occasions is because the seedlings are really um, susceptible to drought. So if you go to the east coast of Ireland, uh, for example, where rainfall is about a third of what it is here, yeah, you'll find rhododendron in woodlands. It might be there as long as the first rhododendron was in the Killarney woodlands, but the rate of invasion is much, much slower because it's the survival success of the seedlings is much lower because it's not as humid an environment. Now, I just need to mention this because it's in the literature. Um, there are suggestions that the populations that are invasive today should be given a different name, a rhododendron superponticum, um, a triffid-like idea, horrifying. Um, put forward by an Irishman actually called it hasn't really taken hold and it's probably not really relevant to our management of it immediately, but it's something to keep an eye on. Um, what I can say is that there is evidence of um, introgression, so hybridization between a North American species, rhododendron catopiense, which is a really cold tolerant species. And a study that was done looking at rhododendron across the British Isles, with only a few samples from Ireland found that in Scotland and Donegal, um, some of the rhododendron, some of the invasive rhododendron uh, populations there had some genes from this rhododendron catopiense in it, which may help them to cope with the colder conditions there. So it's the same beast probably in terms of management, but in terms of what it can ecologically withstand, there's going to be variation. And as the climate changes, and we get less frost and more humidity and more warmth and shorter winters. Um, you know, we might find in places that rhododendron hasn't been as successful as others that it starts to, to become much more comfortable and to be much more aggressive. Um, why have I got this one? Okay, so this is from the, the Global Biodiversity Information System, and it's just again showing you um, the distribution of rhododendron. Um, and in, in Ireland, uh, and you can see, well, also big problems in Scotland and Wales, uh, no accident that I refer to this year a lot. Um, and if you look in here, uh, the same map that Eleanor showed you earlier, except I think I downloaded it three or four days ago, so I didn't spot as many differences in the, in, the, in the yellow squares, but you can see it's pretty widespread across the country. And as Eleanor also alluded, um, you know, each of these is a 10 kilometer square in which rhododendron is present in the wild. Okay, it doesn't mean it's extensive um, or smothering the habitat, there might only be one on the side of a road or, or whatever. Um, but um, so it's, it's, a, it's a record of records as opposed to a record of distribution. But if you look at it with the map beside it, which is um, our bedrock, it just uh, you can kind of see just from where the dark dots are, which is where there, there are very large populations and therefore a lot of records, um, that it, it does really correspond um, a little my, my theory is falling down now because Donegal hasn't been reporting a lot. Um, you know, it does correspond with our, our acid soils, our acid bedrocks. But the take-off from this is that there's 50% of the 10 kilometer squares of Ireland that have rhododendron in them. And if you compare that data with data from 2014, that's been a 13% increase in seven years. Okay, and that's on a very coarse scale. It's where is rhododendron within a 10 kilometer square. And as I say, it's not telling you whether it's one rhododendron or fields of rhododendrons. Um, what I will say is that in Wales, um, they have done two kind of large scale surveys on Snowdonia National Park and in 1986, um, between 1986 and 2005, so just shy of 20 years, they found a 20% increase in the area covered by rhododendron. And that's a net increase, it doesn't include the areas that they've cleared in that time. So it has absolutely still got potential to spread. It's not a problem that we have and it's static and it's fixed what we have now, it's a problem that will grow. Uh, if we let it. So I kind of mentioned already that some areas are more likely to become infested than others uh, when rhododendron is around um, and, and that's really important to understand because it will kind of determine the urgency of your management approach and even the how of your management approach. <clears throat> So in 2014, I think uh, another job undertaken by the National Biodiversity Data Centre was to um, risk assess some of the more 
widespread invasive species in the country. And part of that risk assessment was to look at the potential sites for it. And if you look at it, about 26% of Ireland has habitat on it that could happily support rhododendron. And that was wild habitat. When they added gardens into that, if we were to abandon our gardens and let the rhododendron come in, and that's a possibility nowadays when we're thinking about wilding, um, up to 33% of Ireland could support rhododendron. So look, obviously we're not there, I'm not suggesting for a minute that we have this cover. But if we were to sit back and sit in our hands and leave it off, we could be potentially looking at that uh, down the years. Right, so down to the, the ecology bit. So again, you know, all plants need sunlight to grow. And plants are the basis of the habitat and the food chains for, I say most, pretty much every other organism except for a handful of archaeobacteria that existed before aerobic life came on Earth. Um, and when they don't have light, uh, under a rhododendron thicket, uh, this is what it looks like. So the average light levels under an oak holly canopy in Killarney from a PhD done I don't know how many years ago now is about 8%. That will vary in, in space and the time depending on how sunny it is and all this, but about 8% of daylight. Uh, when you get into a rhododendron thicket like this, this, that comes down to about 2%. So the amount of input is dramatically reduced. Um, and so the main way by which rhododendron impacts habitat is by shade. Okay, it's as simple as that. It just stops the light getting in. Plants can't grow, so the plants are lost. Um, the things that eat the plants are lost, the things that live in the plants are lost. And we get this monoculture, essentially, of rhododendron. A handful of mosses that survive, but not in any great abundance, and they were happy enough before the rhododendron anyway. Um, in the context of woodlands, it's also important, because although the woodlands are still there, and they're still in oak trees, and you'll find them in under these things, you know, those oak trees are doomed. Their children have nowhere to go because if a seed falls into here, it may germinate, it may not, but it may germinate, but it absolutely will not reach adulthood. So when the current cohort, the current group of mature trees die, as they will, the average lifespan of an oak is about 400, 450 years, when they die, there'll be nothing there to replace them. Um, in terms of open ground then, um, rhododendron very much alters the conditions there as well, by the same mechanisms, it exerts shade. Um, and there's also some only anecdotal evidence, but it, it does tend to seem to dry the soil a bit. So you can imagine if you have all this biomass of, of living tissue which has water in it, um, that's going to hold on to a lot of that water and remove it from the soil. And, and that can contribute to the drying out of bogs and wet heaths and so on. So I suppose the bottom line is, and you all knew it coming in the door, I'm sure, that rhododendron reduces the biodiversity of important habitats. Um, just a handful of little studies um, with actual raw data in them. Um, some work of my own with, with colleagues in 2001, counted the number of seedlings per square meter, excuse me, per square meter, um, in Killarney, actually, in the permanent plots uh, around the park in a variety of woodland types. And when you compare the density of seedlings, in infested plots against non-infested plots, you only had a half of a seedling per metre squared where there was rhododendron, compared with an average of 20 per metre squared where there wasn't. Uh, plant species diversity then, uh, Daniel Kelly, my prof and mentor, uh, recorded 14 species on average in infested versus 55 in not infested. And then looking at other animals, mice and voles and birds, much lower numbers in infested areas compared with non-infested, and similarly for Kerry Slug. By my husband in 1998. Um, so woodland has been the focus, I suppose, of rhododendron uh, up until now, um, rightly or wrongly biased because it's a, been a quiet problem that's growing outside of the woods. But just we do have some data, I suppose, on the frequency of rhododendron in woodlands in Ireland from the native the National Semi-Natural Survey of Native Woodlands. I said that very backwards, you know what I mean. Uh, it ran from 2003 to 2008, and more than a thousand sites were surveyed, and rhododendron ponticum was present in about 23% of those sites. It was the most frequent uh, non native um, invader in those sites, followed by, by cherry laurel, which occur on very different sites in, in an invasive capacity. Um, and if you look there, the, the darker line represents the fraction of those sites that were considered to be uh, severely infested, okay? only low infestation rates. In the others, so you're talking about whatever that is, about 10% of woodland sites. And it affects a broad variety of woodlands, uh, some more than others. Acid oak woodlands and conifer woodlands. Conifer woodlands, because of where they tend to be, 
policy in the past encouraged us to plant our woodlands on acidic soils which weren't so good for agriculture so it's washed up the soils and to do with the conifers but there we have it and uh, bog woodland and um, other broadleaf woods often to a lesser extent because of the soil ph and uh, increasingly wet woodlands and i'll explain why about that uh, in a few minutes so i just want to look at the woodlands and why should we care are they any big deal I suppose everyone in this room is probably, well, you're probably all familiar with care if you're not from care, you realise just how important the Kerry woodlands are. It's one of the most expansive semi-natural landscapes that we have in Ireland and it's owned by the state. I mean, that's amazing because it means that we have power. Maybe not enough power to anything, but we have some power to do something in there. We're not having to bring lots of different landowners together and we're not arguing with industry uh, that have other other primary demands. Um, and one of the things about semi-natural habitats occurring in mosaic is that a bit like um, species, you know, we like to call things a species, but in reality life is just this big continuum um, of organisms that all share some amount or other of DNA and have separated off a little bit into pots, but we put the names on them and it's the same with habitats. So really diversity is maximised where those habitats are allowed to breed in and out of each other in a somewhat natural way. So we have very long established woodlands, relatively undisturbed woodlands here, and also they're hyper oceanic. So they have a big influence from um, the sea and from the mild from the Gulf Stream. Um, and so you get an awful lot of diversity of lower plants in particular, mosses, liverworts, ferns and lichens. And you know, they're basically the temperate rainforests um, of the world. Um, we also then, just because of our history and our location, have a range of very important species that don't occur very widely elsewhere on the island or in the British Isles. The strawberry tree, of course, which currently is famous, the Irish spurge, one of the things threatened by the, the grass that being stumped along my lane at home. Um, the Kerry slug, of course, and also the Killarney fern. Open habitats that were also affected, and as I said, they haven't received as much attention, there hasn't been as much research, but the principles are the same. Um, and wet heath, dry heath, bog, and in particular acid, usually mountainous grassland, are all affected. And a site like this is familiar, I'm sure, to all of us driving around the countryside where you see the odd, isolated uh, bush around the jungle. But unfortunately, if we turn our back on it a couple of years down the line, we could well be looking at this. Okay, that's from County Mayo. And again, these open habitats are equally important. Um, for example, within the biosphere, uh, we have the highest concentration of breeding peregrine falcon and merlin in Ireland, two birds of prey. We have 22 different red data book plants, such as the Kerry lily there. We have relics from um, Arctic Alpine uh, conditions that were here in the past. I've already mentioned the slug and the fern, and of course we have the new fern, the nice tail fern uh, as well, new to Europe, uh, but which seems, we're waiting for the molecular work, but seems to have been here for a long, 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 long time, uh, and is not known from anywhere else uh, in, in Europe. And then when we move away from the things that are kind of special or, or, or recognised as special by a designation, there's also sort of the ordinary things that are not designated, but which, along with Attenborough, I've watched become more rare and less commonplace uh, in my lifetime, and I'm a lot younger than Attenborough, about half his age, slightly more than half his age. Um, so the likes of Cranberry and Crowberry, uh, which live on our bogs and heaths, the like of um, the English brown beak sedge when Cosper Fusca, um, the likes of uh, club worms, club mosses, um, and even our ordinary common insectivorous plants. I suppose the point about these is they can only grow on our bogs and our heaths and our acid grasslands that are not drained, that are not dried out, that are not invaded by rhododendron. And we know that they're shrinking and they're commonplace, or we were certainly commonplace before. But they're becoming less commonplace, and most things that are rare were common before they became rare. So it's important to remember that. And um, also, bog rosemary, not local, but an uh, important uh, bog species. And it's not just plants, it's animals too. I'm not going to talk about them particularly, but a lot of animals and insects are particularly associated with our peat glands and our heathlands, which, uh, next to woodland, are the next most susceptible habitat types to remember. So there's an, econ an economic impact too, of course. You know that rhododendron is toxic to animals, so it has no grazing um, potential at all, and therefore reduces uh, the grazing area to farmers, and it can result in land being deemed ineligible 
uh, for cap payments, on which the farmers depend. Um, it has huge impacts in forestry, uh, which is really what's kind of driven the research agenda in, in parts of the UK and Scotland in particular. It's a host for the uh, Remorans blight, otherwise known as sudden oak death, but not an appropriate name in our context, it doesn't affect our oaks. Um, and also infestation affects the replanting um, of cleared sites and, and the success of crop growth. And actually a lot of the rhododendron pontican subspecies pontican within the Bulgaria, Georgia part of the world, that's their big problem. It's actually their, their timber industry and it's native there and, and it's a problem for them. There's also tourism impacts, actually referred to the, the tourists lost uh, in County Tipperary there a few years back. I have the photograph in a minute. Um, but it can overgrow footpaths and lighting tracks, and it's another resource during then on managers of the likes of national parks and other recreation areas to have to be, be keeping them open. Um, and for walkers and people who want to kind of visit the, the open habitats of the uplands, if they're swamped in rhododendron, it's much less accessible. And if you do go in, uh, you're in trouble potentially. Uh, putting pressure on the rescue services, many of which are volunteers. Um, and then of course, and I'm not saying a lot about it, but the big picture is if you lose the ecosystem services that were provided by those habitats in the first place, the carbon capture and holding uh, by the bogs, the water filtration by the bogs, if they were wet, because rhododendron will help them to, to dry out, um, the carbon capture of our woodlands. And although the rhododendron is holding some carbon, because it is a plant, it's capturing carbon the same as the rest of them, it's stopping the, the long-term future um, of our woodlands, so, so they won't be there for some future. That's the site uh, in the V where the, the tourists got lost in County Tipperary. Um, so other kind of less direct, I suppose, impacts economically around the gender are the fact that we, you know, we're liable. We've signed up to the European Habitats Directive. We've said that we will maintain particular types of habitat in what's called good conservation status. And if we don't do it, we will be fined. Okay, and rhododendron in a native woodland or on a native heath or in a native bog is not good conservation status. So we are for we will be charged for, for not managing it. Um, and somewhat because of that, and somewhat because they're good guys and they want to do the right thing, the Forest Service spent uh, about a million a year on control, that was in 2014. Uh, Northern Ireland was spent about 270 million uh, thousand pounds, excuse me. Um, Killarney National Park in 2011, 2017, paid 700,000, I think. Shane, will update you on the detail of that and maybe something more recent later. Um, and the costs reported for control of it vary a lot between sites, but the average is about uh, £670,000 um, for 1,200 hectares. Okay, it'll vary a lot depending on the type of infestation, the location, and the, the approach to management and the level of infestation. I just mentioned this one in case anyone was under it, they might have heard of it. There's a thing called mad honey disease, um, which has killed people, not many, uh, and only in, I think, Turkey. Um, and yeah, and it's where the toxins from the rhododendron plant, because all parts of it are toxic, um, got their way, made their way into beehives, which were used for honey production, and uh, tasted very nice by all accounts, but can cause uh, heart failure and, and, other, and other problems if it doesn't go that far. Uh, so, if you're beekeepers and you're tempted by the, the bees buzzing uh, on the rhododendron flowers, be careful. Um, there are some generalist Irish bees which use rhododendron. Jane Stout's work in Trinity a long time ago showed that. But there are equally some of our wild bees which are in trouble too, to whom to rhododendron is toxic. So, you know, it's, nothing is ever simple in ecology, unfortunately. So how do we deal with all of this? Um, so knowledge is power would be my way of thinking and talking. And we really need to understand the biology and the behaviour of the species in different scenarios um, to really inform best approaches to management. And because rhododendron is green and it produces tiny little seeds and it doesn't respect fences or your land or my land, you really need action at at least a local level and sometimes at a regional level. Um, you know, going in on your own to clear your patch while your neighbour's rhododendron is thriving left, next, left and right of you it's just going to be heartbreaking. So it starts off life uh, much smaller than this. That seedling there is probably five or six years old. Um, up here, it looks kind of benign. You kind of think, what, what's that going to do to me? Not too much. Uh, but then maybe 12, 13, 14 years will go to this, and given enough time, will grow into a dense thicket. And the same image again, it looks like that below, below it. And there are things that help us to do this along the way. 
So it's very unpalatable to braces. There's quite a lot of insects associated with it. And for a while there in the late 90s, early 90s, um, there was a lot of interest in trying to see could we find something that we might introduce to control it. But none of them have really delivered. And to be honest, there's a lot of risk assessment to be done around using biological um, pest control, especially on the scale that we need to use it. You wonder what would it do to the things that were closely related to it, like our arbutus, for example. So it's probably an ongoer. Um, but the fact that it's not palatable to raisins means that where our oak tastes delicious and our birch, not so nice, but they eat it anyway, our ash tastes amazing, although not a huge issue on Ruddy and susceptible sites generally. Uh, when there are deer or there are sheep or there are cattle or goats, um, they're going to eat everything but the rhododendron. So its competitors are, are swept out of its way. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that there's no significant predators, again, associated probably simply with the toxicity. And as well as Casting a very dense shade is also able to tolerate quite a dense shade. So it will grow very happily in the 8% of daylight that's typical under our oak holly canopies. Um, if the woods are overgrazed, there's even more light in there because it's not much of an understory. So, you know, that's no barrier to it. Um, and as I said, it grows year round in, in the right conditions. It reproduces freely and very successfully, both vegetatively and from seed. I'll, I'll delve into that a bit. So, in terms of from seed, it flowers annually, we know, for Kerry, from Killarney, for about 10 to 12 years onwards. But actually, when you dig down into that, and that was work done by John Cross way back in 1975 that everybody quoted in every paper that was ever written on Rotterdam since. But actually, when you go and talk to people in Scotland, or even in Donegal, or even in the east of Ireland, it doesn't necessarily flower every year there. Um, Top of Fin Oak was only every two or three years did the same plant flower, so you're not getting quite the same burst of seed um, and also can take a lot longer to mature to flowering age uh, where conditions are poor so say where there's a shorter growing season in, in Scotland so they talk like around um, I can't remember the site it was just north of Glasgow I don't know if I remember anyway they were reckoning about 21 22 years there before it typically flowered and that has a bearing on the timing of your management because you can kind of tolerate uh, regrowth a little bit longer if you're sure you're going to get there before, before it does flower um, each flower head can produce lots and lots of seeds. We're talking the thousands. Um, they're very small. I'll have an image in a second. They've got a little frill of hairs on them, so they'll attach to my clothes, they'll attach to the dog, to the deer, to the badger, to the fox, to the birds, whoever's moving through. Um, most of the seed tends to be dumped close to the seed source, but they can travel further. Okay, up to about a kilometre uh, is is kind of a, a good rule of thumb to take in mind if you're trying to create a buffer. Um, some people have proposed that there's no seed bank, others have proposed that there is. I think there's not a long seed bank, um, possibly where we have sites that we thought were clear of rhododendron for a long time and suddenly we're seeing seeds arrive, it, it's usually due to a missed plant. So April to June, it looks like this, and everybody goes, oh, the lovely rosy dandrums, and they are beautiful, so don't get away from it. Um, and then when these flowers are fertilised, um, they develop into seed pods. So each of these flowers, it's, it's, a, it's an inflorescence, what we call it in botany. Uh, lots of different flowers on the head, I think something like 25 to 30 per head. Uh, each of those then will become a pod of seeds and then that will burst open and release the seeds. And the seeds are absolutely tiny, a millimetre or two. I liken them to tea leaves from a tea bag. So you can see how many there are and how far they can go. And that's just from one seed pod here. So if you multiply that up over a large standard rhododendron, that's a lot of seed. So that's fine. Okay, we've established it's not great. We don't want it. What can we do about it? Cut it down, get rid of it. That's fine, except the plant has other ideas and it is extremely challenging to manage. It's not impossible, but it's extremely managing. So the first thing to say is that like most broadleaf things, it will regrow when cut and it regrows very vigorously. Okay, so just cutting away the canopy and even the stump in the ground is not the end of the story. And even more than that, when you do walk away from a stump without killing it, it can flower more profusely um, within a couple of years. Um, this is one that was actually dug up by a mattock back in the groundwork days, uh, and turned upside down, and this was it flowering after 18 months. Okay, so it's a really, um, it's not like a step, responds very well to stress just ramps up the adrenaline and goes for it, you're not going to get me. Um, the other problem about the regrowth issue, if you if you don't manage to kill the stump on the first time around, is that when it regrows, it goes from being something like this 
to being something like this because it wants to cop us essentially so where there was previously one branch it wants to make two or three or four and it changes the shape of the tree especially with something that was in under a canopy that was tall and leggy it's only really producing leaves across the top once you go in and cut that back and convert it to this you're ramping up your seed production i don't know many, how, how many times fold but a lot so very often attempts to control rhododendron that didn't succeed actually leave you with the worst situation than if you just left it alone in the first place. So you have to throw your all into it, you have to commit to it, um, and you have to follow up. So herbicide, I'm afraid to say, is going to be absolutely vital. I cannot see um, us clearing rhododendron without herbicide, that and several other uh, invasive species. And although I'm not one for chemicals personally, um, I stood right in the day when glyphosate is banned, but anyway. Um, so even with the herbicides, it's, it's a bit of a trick. It's hard to get the herbicide into the leaves. Um, because of the way the herbicide works, uh, you have to get it uh, into every individual stem. It doesn't translocate across from this stem to the next stem and the next stem. So obviously the more multi stems your plants are, therefore, the harder they are to treat. So that's another reason not to, to cut it until you have a plan and a resource in place to, to really kill it. Um, and you get regrowth from stems quite often. Um, there's no fail safe, 100% sure way um, of, of outright killing a bush in one visit. Um, so there's often several rounds of treatment uh, required. In terms of vulnerability to invasion, it will only thrive and only set seed really abundantly where conditions are perfect. Okay, now unfortunately, across most of Kerry, conditions are perfect. Okay, so that's not great news for you. I suppose it's just something to bear in mind if you're somewhere else, it just would conjig the time of your management. Um, I think I said all of this for fosters where I was supposed to yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but yes, as I say, it's, it's less regular and possibly later in, in the, the, the age of the plant uh, in, in less optimal sites. In terms of vulnerability to invasion of sites, the seeds are really, really small and they've no reserve of food. They're not like an acorn that can sit on top and has enough energy in the nut to, to get its little baby root down into the soil to get water and food. Rhododendron has to hit the ground running and get going. So it really needs access to a moist substrate quickly that isn't going to dry out, but at the same time it won't grow in standing, it won't establish in standing water. So it needs what John Cross called safe sites in order to establish. So if you look at these images here, um, the leaf litter on the ground has sort of prevented seedlings from taking place, from taking hold, but they were very happy to get going on this trunk of something else that had been cut years before. Similarly here, this is a site that would flood regularly, uh, but there was this little, um, just a fallen branch, a fallen trunk uh, on the ground, which just kept, you know, was dry long enough to allow seedlings to get going, and that's where they get going. So if you have a site that's mostly leaf litter, very dense leaf litter, or it does flood a lot, it's not that rhododendron won't get in, it will, if it's, if it's introduced, it will, it will get in, but the rate of invasion will be much slower. Um, if there's a very well-developed field layer, that will also help to reduce the rate of establishment because, again, the seed just can't get down to the soil through what's there. And that's one of the things I think in Killarney that's really made rhododendron difficult is the, the overgrazing history um, back in the day. And similarly, if you expose soil by any kinds of activity, uh, burning, forestry operations, trampling, poaching, this can also increase the, the likelihood of your, your site to being infested. So if you're somebody who doesn't have rhododendron on your site, but you need to do something to that site because there's a lot of rhododendron nearby, you want to factor not letting that rhododendron take hold uh, into your management plan. Um, areas close to a large seed source, obviously, uh, will colonise very quickly. And the timing and type of grazing can matter. Um, so you can get, depending on, on changes of when they happen, from uh, the single bush to, to an awful lot of it, but only if there's enough access to soil here. Okay, so if it's overgrazed with a lot of our soil and it's still damp, uh, they'll get in. If that was a very dense sward of native vegetation, it would take an awful lot longer for that to happen. Uh, these are just some images from Snowdonia. Uh, I thought these, are, these two in particular were very interesting. They're both, um, it's very hard to see. They're, this one, for example, like just two different landowners. And uh, it looks like on the side, uh, on the same hill, 
a doctor at Valley, he had the same, this guy has another vaccinium here, which would suggest that the grazing levels were lower um, at the time that the rhododendron seed was introduced, because uh, vaccinium um, bilberry is really palatable and sheep and goats and everything go for it first, it's usually the first thing to go uh, from grey sites. Um, so there's still a lot of vaccinium, but as you can see, the rhododendron has done very well. On this side, it's really a very tightly grazed sward by sheep, and sheep and goats and horses will nibble rhododendron unwittingly when it's very, very small. So the grazing picture is not simple either. Okay, on the other hand, if you overgraze it and you have poach marks and exposed soil, then that's giving the site for germination. So it's really a, a fine balance and there's different approaches can be taken. And this one is not very clear. It's just a similar story, I suppose, except it's woodland. I don't know, can you see the fence? I really can't. can't really. No, there's a fence down here. Can't see it. Anyway, the area to the right has quite a lot of rhododendron in there. The area to the left doesn't. And again, it's just because of the type of grazing regime that they're doing. Um, so overgrazed woodlands in Killarney is really where rhododendron has gone berserk. Um, and it doesn't fest them really, really very, very aggressively. Um, and there's evidence to support this theory that biologists call an invasion of meltdown um, in conjunction with the Sika deer. And I'm just kind of throwing it in, it's, it's passed, it's happened, but I think it's interesting. Um, so Rhododendron was planted into a couple of different places around Killarney in the mid 1800s, and slightly after that, Sika deer were introduced. So for the first 50 or 60 years of the Sika deer were here, the estate was functioning as an estate, there was regular hunting and Parting going on, and the Sika deer numbers were kept relatively low. When the Herberts lost the estate and it was mar mortgaged out and eventually sold, um, the, that fashion for hunting wasn't in the family that were here and it stopped. And it was at this point that the Sika deer uh, numbers started to really increase. And of course, they're very shy species, uh, less so as they have less woodland and there's more of them to eat. But when they have first choice of habitat, is to be somewhere quiet and away from people and, and you know, out of the way, so in the woods, in other words. Um, so when you look back through the literature of all the different people that visited Killarney and described what they were seeing, um, the first reports of sizable clumps in the woods of Killarney were from Tansley, who was an ecologist who kind of travelled around Britain and Ireland describing all the different vegetation types. Um, by the 1950s, another pair of, of botanists doing a similar thing uh, described rhododendron as being present in significant thickets. And it was then by the 70s that it was being acknowledged as being a major problem. So you see there was a lag between the introduction and the invasion really of, of the park and, and that it really does go hand in hand with, excuse me, with the grazing story. So it's not to say if the woods hadn't been very overgrazed that there wouldn't be rhododendron, and of course there would, but it might not be to the same extent. Um, and this is something that's really uh, important to think about if we do get to the point where we've cleared our rhododendron, you know, what, what are we going to do next? Because we don't want the bare soil over, we want those woodlands thriving and back and as they should be. So planning for post clearance is really very important as well. Um, so in terms of planning your management, how would you plan to go about it? Well, you need to take time to plan, just rushing in with a hatchet or a mattock or whatever your, your weapon of choice is, um, is not likely to, to be terribly successful in the long run. And you need to understand your own site because there's loads of different ways of coming at rhododendron management. Okay, there's no one magic bullet, and I really challenge anyone who thinks that there is. Um, but the approach can be similar as long as you understand your site and what your priorities are. Um, your resources are very important, and I was really pleased to hear the minister say what was it that his government resources would match community ambition regarding biodiversity. So that's kind of putting it at us, lads. We need to up that ambition and, and he'll deliver the resources, hopefully, uh, to, to do what we can do. Um, so, and then that's going to be a time frame. You're not going to have, you know, you're not going to start in January and be celebrating the rhododendron free site by Christmas. Well, you might be, but you'd be very lucky uh, and very unusual if you are. So if your site is one of those that's vulnerable to a lot of invasion, so if it, there's a lot of safe sites for germination, the most efficient plan, if you can do it, is to eliminate your seed sites, your seed sources, okay? And then devote your resources to reinfestation. Quality control is really, really important. You cannot underestimate the will to live of this species. It does not want to be killed. It wants to live. Okay, it fights back. So you really need to 
be very strict uh, in your doing in the first place and then in your follow up and then in your monitoring after that. And you do have to take into consideration health and safety and environmental impact considerations. I'm not going to say anything more about that, just to flag it. Um, and that there may be other local considerations in terms of uh, the stakeholders, excuse me, that are relevant to your site and what you're trying to do. So it's good to talk to the neighbours. Um, a successful eradication strategy is possible. Uh, the scale of it may be different, um, but within a given site, you can clear all rhododendron and keep them out of it. Now, I'm not saying that within Clarion National Park you can clear all rhododendron and keep it out of it, but you can designate areas within any size of the site, Snowdonia, um, Cairngorm National Park, um, what's the island, um, the Collins Sea Island, um, where there's been big, you know, you prioritise where it is you want to go first and you hope and pray that somebody would have the resources to, to carry that on. Um, and the, the key to keeping the sites free and to making good on the resources and the energy and the sweat and the tears that you put in is that once you start managing a plot of land, whether it's the size of the corner over there, the room, the hotel, muckers, that you don't allow rhododendron back in again. You cannot allow it to flower because otherwise, you know, you're back against it. So you have to maintain this as important as a primary occurrence. And you have to look at your whole site. I'm not saying you have to manage your whole site, but you have to look at your whole site. And you even have to look at your neighbour's sites. Because if you have your whole site and you're able to clear it, and your next door neighbours have ordered down to the other side, you will be forever managing the input from there. And if that's it, so be it. But you need to acknowledge that and act on it and do it. Um, Prioritisation of work then is obviously required because depending on what kind of site you have, you'll be deciding where to work first and so on. And you do need to map and plan in advance because you do really need to understand your site. Where is it? Where is it really bad? Where is the seed being produced? Uh, where are the areas that that seed is going to cause most damage and quickest? So in terms of survey, as I said, not just your site, but also look over the fence and see what's around you. And you need to classify um, your infestation. This is one classification, there's, there's probably others. Um, it's, I'm trying to figure out exactly where this came from. It's a, it's a combination of something from John Cross and I think something from Bill, if I'm right, I don't know, anyway. Um, but it's, it's kind of mapping every bit of your land that you have control of according to how severe your infestation is. And if you produce that map and you can see it visually, uh, with GIS these days is a lot we can do, I think Shane will be talking more about that later, you, you get a, you know, you have, much, you have much more power in terms of, of where you're going to go. Um, once you've done that and identifying especially the seed sources, especially the sensitive areas, you then need to decide, you know, what places can I access, where can't I, what previous work has been done, what status the rhododendron is, has this already been cut before and if so it's much likely to be more expensive and take longer for the that initial, even if it's a second initial uh, clearance. And then you need to prioritise areas and how you prioritise areas will depend on what your goal is overall. Um, I'll come back to that. You also need to plan for native flora recovery, not just because you want it there, if you're doing it for conservation purposes, but also because it will really reduce the risk of reinfestation. And you need to have a management plan, you need to stick with it unless you have a very good reason not to, and you need to keep the records as you work through so that if um, there's a change of management, which of course, especially somewhere like a national park, that's going to happen very, very regularly. In my time, I think, I think it might be my fifth, Shamey, regional manager <laughs> in my time in Killarney. Um, it's a bit like the Queen and our Prime Ministers. Um, so, you know, the records need to be kept so that it can be handed, handed forward, handed down. So in terms of prioritising your management, um, you know, you're, you'd be very lucky if you're, if you're on a site that you can go in, uh, as I said, in January, clear the lot and be on maintenance forever and ever again um, after that. So in most sites, um, you, you need to decide what is it that you want. Is it that you want this field empty because you want to use it for something or, or what is it? So from my perspective as a conservation biologist, I'm always interested in getting the habitat back and keeping the habitat as good as it can be. So for my approach, and it would be what I would think should apply to a national park, but that's for them to decide, having the highest priority should be to the areas that don't have rhododendron in it yet, and those that have a small amount of rhododendron in it, which are not already destroyed by the rhododendron. They'll be quicker to manage, and they are 
they're closest to natural, they're closest to what we want it to be. Um, so they're, they're important. Then after that, if there's different areas, and again, your map really is important here, if there's different areas that are at that level that you can clear, and you can get them into a single bigger block, even the better. So you might do a really intense block in the middle of that, because it will save those blocks around it. Um, and then I would, you, you kind of can work down, and again, it will depend on, on what you're trying to achieve, but the lowest priority for me in somewhere like a national park or a nature reserve would be the really big areas that's going to cost the world and the earth to do it, and I'd just be trying to put a buffer around them and, and keep my other areas that I actually have some hope of clearing, clear. Um, so what's common to I'm sorry, I talk so much. What's common to most er er eradication strategies are three phases of work. Uh, the preliminary clearance, which goes in and takes down the mature plants, um, including the killing of stumps, we'll talk, talk about in a second. Um, and then for the next couple of years, you need to be checking that site because stump kill can take three or four years to, to, to visibly observe um, and, and you need to make sure that you achieved it. The second phase of clearance then is to sweep through the area, again, double checking that your stumps are dead, but also getting seedlings that have been missed, because initially they're very, very small. So even with, with the best will in the world, with as many people as you like combing through an area of woodland or heath or bog, you're going to miss them. So the ideal time to kill seedlings is when they're big enough um, that you can easily see them and not miss them, when most of them will have died off because of drought, okay? So picking lots of little things like this is kind of a waste of time. Most of them are not going to survive. Um, but thirdly and most importantly, before they can flower, okay? If they have flowered before you pull them, you're, you're back at the start of the race in some respects. And then finally, the maintenance phase, which I've talked about, which is a systematic approach uh, to clearing through. And the timing of that will depend on where you are, how your rhododendron grows, how early you set seeds. So for Killarney and Kerry and most of the rest of the world, I'm afraid, it's about a six to eight yearly cycle that's required. That's if you're certain that phase two and phase one have been successful. If you're not, you need to be kind of redoing phase two until you have that successful and then going into your six to eight year maintenance trial. Um, I'm going to have to skip through. Jamie, you can say more than, <laughs> than we said this morning. Um, you need to clean, kill your mature plants and sweep through for seedlings. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, this is Peter O'Toole standing uh, in the middle of a, what was an intact clump, but the, some of it has been removed, but this is, this is still what's ahead of him there. Um, I have been on sites where this has been done mechanically with uh, machines on flails. The, the reality is there's not many of those sites around. Land is too stony um, and rocky, too steep. And although we can do things in terms of compaction or whatever, you know, there, are, there is other collateral damage there. Um, in terms of killing stumps, you know, uprooting is one way to do it, and it can be very, very effective. Um, it's very, very labour intensive, however. So herbicides are almost always involved, and there's various different um, things, uh, licensed for use, uh, the most popular, which is glyphosate. Foliar spraying was the, the, the standard way for many, many decades, and you know, it, it is still possible, especially where you have isolated bushes. Um, it's not ideal, um, but it can work. It needs the same checkup that every other um, approach does. Um, there's some lads at it there. There's problems with it, um, which are, sorry, I'm not going to go through all that because I'm talking too long. The collateral damage is an issue. So when you're foliar spraying, you use a lot of herbicide and a lot of it gets blown into the surrounding vegetation and can kill it. And that then in turn provides a lovely seedbed for recovery of rhododendron. So, you know, it, it's not really a, a method of choice. In terms of direct stump treatments, um, you want to be treating them uh, as low to the ground as possible um, and covering the entire stump, but especially the area around the edge actually, because the, the centre of the, the stump is not fired biologically active, it's the, the xylem will flow just under the bark and the cambium there that's uh, active. And what you're trying to do is get that herbicide down into the root. So you need to, to treat those. And if it was a plant that had uh, buttress roots, and you need to scar them and, and treat them as well. Um, so this can be quite successful. There's quite a, 
a tidy word sank behind it. I'm not necessarily for tidiness in nature, but it's really important in rhododendron management so that you can access the site afterwards to check what you've done and to deal with seedlings. Um, so there's a dead stump there being nicely recolonised by, uh, by native mosses and some uh, foxgloves. Um, the advantage of the direct stone treatments is that unlike foliar spray, you can do it at the same time as that you take away the, the big stuff. So that, that's very, very important. Um, you don't use a whole lot of herbicide compared to foliar spraying, and as I said, there's less risk of herbicide drift. You're not left with standing dead plants, and that's something which I um, may be in conflict with some people on, in that I think leaving standing dead plants doesn't leave you a tidy, a tidy workplace to get back and do the very, very important uh, follow-up work, but maybe in certain certain situations that's okay. Um, and the disadvantages are that um, you do need a little cut, so it can be really hard on your chainsaw, you need a tungsten blade, and even then that might be, you need to replace quite often, and you do need dry weather, uh, reasonably dry weather to, to carry this out. Um, the eco plug is something I have not seen in action, I've only read publications about, and this is um, glyphosate uh, in a powder form in um, a plastic bullet essentially that you hammer in to cut stumps. Uh, I was on to Bear or I mean Monsanto, and they, there is talks about developing um, a plant based plastic that is compostable, which means you'd be able to leave that in and not worry about introducing plastic into your environment. Um, there's a lot of advantages to this. Um, the disadvantages first is that it's expensive. Okay, it kind of triples the cost of of liquid-based uh, herbicide application. But the advantages are fairly significant. Um, it's not dependent on weather or season. So even if the plant is not actively growing, um, the glyphosate sits uh, until the sap is, is flowing and the root starts to grow again later on, and then starts moving it around down into the root. So your kill won't be as quick, but it will happen. Um, there's hardly any risk of contamination or collateral damage. Um, they recommend up to two days uh, for the fastest results, that you, you, you insert your, your eco plug before two days are passed. But actually, the Forest uh, the Forestry Commission research found that actually up to 12 weeks, you got the same level of kill, but it might take a bit longer. Um, yeah, you can see what it says there. Uh, stem injection is another one uh, where you inject uh, or squirt uh, glyphosate into the plant without actually cutting it down. So from a labour point of view, it's very attractive um, and it can be very useful for isolated plants that don't have lots of stems on them because again, just like with the foliar spraying, you have to get every individual stem or you won't kill it. Um, it uses quite a high concentration of glyphosate that might be lower now, I'm a bit out of date on this. Um, and there's all sorts of ways to apply the herbicide, you can paint it, spray it, uh, whatever, and it's effective all year round. Um, and this is, I'm uh, pretty sure that's Peter O'Toole there, uh, squirting, hacking and squirting with the hatchet and, and the squirt. So it's very low tech, uh, which can be an advantage. Um, this is a similar approach, except done with chainsaw. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so the advantages of these is that you don't use a lot of herbicide. Uh, it reduces the, the, the risk of collateral damage to the native vegetation, and you don't have to handle rash, and you don't need specialist equipment. You can't do it in the rain. You have to catch every stem. You do need, I think, to remove the dead plants. And when there's very dense stems uh, in big dense stands, it's, it's very, I can imagine doing it. I've never done it, but I can imagine it's painful trying to make sure that you have them all. Um, brush, I want to mention, and kind of dead wood or sandy dead comes in with this because you have to manage your brush somehow. If you just cut it and leave it behind you, you can't get back to check and whatever does regrow, because some will regrow, I think 90% is about as effective as most methods are on one go. So there will be 10% of what you've attempted to kill will regrow. So you have to access them and you cannot predict where those plants are. So if you have brash everywhere, you can't get them. So different ways uh, of managing brash, uh, this is um, Peter O'Toole's innovation um, to, to use them as dead hedges to keep deer out, which is fantastic because it means that you, you, the native vegetation gets a rest from the grazing. Um, other options are to windrow it, uh, to mulch it, or in the old days to burn it uh, on site. Um, it leaves a, 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 you know, an accessible space. Um, this, of course, is the problem that when you put fuel onto the hill, and there's lots of fuel already anyway, that if there is a fire, which sadly we had here uh, for seven or eight days, whatever it was, uh, last April, or back in 1984 for 
How many weeks of open from yesterday? The seven weeks. I don't think I'd ever heard it burned quite that long before. But you know, we have studies, we have evidence, we know that when there's fire, even if the trees are not cut outright, it damages them and it adds to their stress. Um, so it's, 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 you know, and the fuel just adds that risk if it's on the ground, whether as brash in whatever form or as standing dead or the dead. Um, ironically, of course, the living or the dead won't burn at all. Doesn't do us any good, just as really the way to live. And, you know, can save <laughs> patches if it's there as a barrier, as a fence. Um, these are just shots from the last while, uh, post April, of, of, you know, where there was obviously standing dead stuff that, that burnt um, and, and what it looked like afterwards. Um, in terms of approaches to advance and final clearance and also to maintenance, you know, systematic sweeping is really the ideal way to do it, but it needs all these people. These are all people from all over the world that used to come and volunteer uh, for 12 weeks in the summer. Not each of them individually 12 weeks, but for 12 weeks or 30 odd years um, to do whatever, to, to clear what to And when you have a workforce like that, it was great because you can form, this is forming a line. We're out from the wood, our focus is the woodland, but we're doing the buffer thing. So we're coming out 50, 100 yards uh, into the surrounding heath to make sure we don't miss any plants that will flower uh, and cause us problem. Um, and that is, I think, probably one of the most important and least successfully achieved across all residential urban plants um, aspects of the clearance, and it's the follow-up, especially on sites that are big. It's fine if you have a small site, it's easier to do. Somewhere like the park, it's a nightmare. When you look at a woodland on a map, and you think it's this shape and it's straight, uh, no one ain't when you get in there. There's gullies, there's rocks, there's cliffs. You know, it's impossible. A walk-over type approach to that, a casual approach to that, it's extremely, extremely different, difficult to, to maintain. So it really needs to be done. It needs to be done regularly enough, depending on how fast your rhododendron is maturing, that no plant is allowed to set seed, because otherwise you're just prolonging your agony. Um, and again, you know, herbicide treatment can be used there. I'm not prescribing how you would deal with your, your saplings and your seedlings when you find them, pull them, squirt them, whatever um, is appropriate. Now the timing is important, as I've already said, and you don't want to put out safe sites. So if you can at all manage that woodland so that the grazing level is low, um, or that open land either so the grazing level is low and allow the native vegetation to recover as quickly as possible, that will also help you in your fight. I've said all that already. Uh, yeah, this is just an example of some uh, reinfestation, which unfortunately has already got to flower in some of the woods somewhere. Um, so look, I'm gonna finish up my sorry, I know I'm late. Um, my, my take home messages are kind of brief, Know your enemy, understand its ecology, and understand how it works on your site. Um, quality control will increase the success of clearance. And it is possible to achieve an area that is clear of rhododendron. And in my mind, we should be achieving that. It might not be possible for an entire park or an entire valley, but if we focus our approach correctly, we can have areas that we designate as rhododendron-free zones, and then have buffers outside of those uh, that we can concentrate on to stop those free zones being reinfested. Uh, close attention to detail at the operational stage, know how to apply the herbicide, where to apply it, when to apply it, um, and remember no method of stump killing is 100% effective. Um, that's the thing again, I won't go into that. Just to mention those two documents um, that are very useful and very complete. Um, and it's funny, I came, I modified this list of 10, I think it is. Um, I, I believe it all so passionately, and funny enough, the Welsh and the Scottish <coughs> documents came in with it. Um, it can be done. You nearly always need initial and two follow ups. It will take at least five to eight years. Uh, on many sites, it will be more than that. Uh, a piecemeal approach just won't do it. You have to think of the landscape uh, in total. Um, eradication is the ideal goal, at least in parts of your site if you can, and if it can't, use clear buffer zones. Um, if you incompletely treat a stand, it will recover very, very quickly, and the, the clearance cost of that can be more expensive than if you came at it uh, initially. You need a long-term commitment from the landowner or the manager, whoever it is, so on conservation sites where it's staff as opposed to owners that are doing things, it's really important that there's handover and continuity and that we try and stick to a plan. Um, prevention is better, cheaper 
and faster than the cure. So prioritize containment of your infestation, wherever it is that you are. And this is a line, well, it's, a, it's a concept that struck me when I read a book on the National Park, the author is here, the editor is here, about rhododendron being a type of pollution, that if it was a chemical, we would be in uproar. How were we allowing this chemical into our environment with all the havoc that it reaches? And it makes our work, those of us that are interested in managing invasives, that much harder because, you know, the ordinary person that is getting better than the ordinary person find it hard to understand the complexities and the, the real extent of the damage that invasive species, and in this case, rhododendron, does. This is Lana, and all the green you can see there at the bottom is rhododendron, and only means most of those trees is rhododendron. Um, you know, it's, it's not nice. And then this is another one uh, taken more recently in the Blue Pool one in Killarney, uh, which contains vast diversity of woodland types, not all of them native. Um, but I was here with my professor Daniel Kelly there over the summer, and this is what the really, really rare alder car, this alder on floating peat woodland, is looking like after rhododendron management. And you know, those stumps that you're looking at there, they're Carex paniculata, which is a the, the Greater Tussock Sedge, which is the kind of dominant, usually the dominant um, plant in this habitat. And you can see, you know, I, I don't see that looking like alder car woodland again in my lifetime. Maybe it will, maybe I'm wrong, nature might prove me wrong, I hope it does. Um, but sometimes it, it's maybe it's too late. Sometimes in some places, maybe you need to say, no, we'll leave that one, but let's focus on this stuff over here that we can save. And that's it. I've robbed another line from uh, COP26. Uh, now is our last best chance. Okay, and I would have said that 10 years ago, would have said it 20 years ago, would have said it 25 years ago when I first came, I suppose. Um, but we only have now and tomorrow. The sooner we start, the better. Um, and thank you to everybody who's informed me and to everybody who's stuck with this for the last hour and 40 minutes. My apologies. <laughs> all agree that she deserves a rhubarb gin now <laughs> and not to wait till tonight. Dr. Therese Higgins, thank you so much for your passion, your dedication to this cause and your exhaustive research. I think we've all learned so much today from your presentation. So thank you very much. And thank you for bringing along Sir David Attenborough as well to today's conference. Uh, lovely to see him as always. And uh, I think his message for hope in terms of the climate change debate, which often can be very overwhelming for members of the public, for children, for all of us. Um, I think we can apply that to the rhododendron fight just as much as the climate change fight. And I think what struck me from that presentation that he said was that we're the greatest problem solvers to ever have existed on this planet. And I think having a room of problem solvers here today is just the start. So we're going to have a break for lunch and we're going to continue to solve some problems after the break. Hope everybody enjoyed lunch. It was very, very tasty. Thanks to everybody at the Brennan. And now our next speaker at today's conference is Trisha Dean. Now, Trisha is the project manager with the McGillicuddy Reeks European Innovation Partnership Project. And it's a locally led agri-environmental project. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may be involved in it here in this room today. And Trisha's going to tell us an awful lot more about it. It's focused on developing innovative actions for high nature value farming in the McGillicuddy Reeks. And uh, it works closely, and kind of harping back to what we were talking about before lunch, about bringing everybody on this journey with us. And it works with local landowners and stakeholders in the Reeks, uh, identifies maybe training and positive outreach as well, opportunities, and uh, a really interesting project, and part of it is managing rhododendron. So I'll hand you over now to Trisha Dean. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much for all coming today. It's great to see such a big turnout because I know it's hard times with COVID and COVID paranoia, and need a bit of a sniff or a cough or anything like that alone. We're all kind of going, oh shit, do that. So thanks, guys, for being here. And uh, thanks to my good colleagues, and Mary Lawrence, for being here. So guys, I also work with South Kerry Development Partnership. So I was asked actually yesterday by one of the students that we had out, uh, what exactly does South Kerry work for? Because I was like, so confused between telling them about the biosphere, telling them about the EIP project, which is the European Innovation Partnership project, 
and telling them about the McGill Creepies Forum, they were kind of going, what? Who? Why? So I work for South Carolina Development Partnership, so does Eleanor, so does Gerald. South Carolina Development Partnership is a not-for-profit locally led organisation, so that's just to give you a bit of context. So we work across a range of different programmes. So um, why am I here? It's because, well, we're situated, it's an active project situated in the biosphere. A number of our landowners are here and some of our VIP treatment specialists as well are here that are being treating very successfully the rhododendron, thank God, on the ground. Okay, so that's just a bit of background. I hope you're not too tired now after the lunch, but I think the lunch was light enough that you won't fall asleep. But if I see you nodding off it, you aren't. I'm going to shout out at you. <laughs> okay. So guys, Ashley, thank you very much for the lovely uh, introduction there. It is, guys, a uh, big, big mouthful. It's uh, developing innovative actions. So basically the idea behind these projects was that we would come up with things that hadn't been done before, hadn't been tried or tested, okay? And the idea was then everything we were doing in these EIP projects would feed, in, feed into the new camp. So that's the idea that all the learnings we've taken from these projects fed into the new common agriculture policy to look at these issues and challenges that we face on the ground and seek it to be made part of policy going forward. Does that make sense? It's very boring stuff, as I know, but we get to the exciting stuff in it. Okay. So there you go, guys. That is not the Alps. I'm all very clear to say this. I'm very, very proud of coming from the mountain myself. I come from the Schwedenish Mountains. Uh, my father, the sheep farmer, he's here with us for today. He came along to learn more about rhododendron so he can torment the life of everyone that has it growing in their gardens. Um, so, yeah, that's, it's tough going. Uh, it's tough going to treat rhododendron, but it's particularly tough going to try and treat rhododendron on mountainous terrain. Okay, so uh, there you go. So, we've loads of different partners. A lot of our partners are here today. We work very closely, obviously, with the Department of Agriculture because they're our funders. It's European funding and comes from the World Development Programme. We also work very closely with the staff in the National Park who have been very, very supportive to us the last number of years since we established the programme. And we also work very closely with NTU, the college, because obviously they have done a huge amount of research down through the years and we don't know everything, nor do we profess to know everything, and nor are we experts. The Mountain Access Forum, um, obviously because guys, uh, we cannot work and get the work that we do done without the farmers. Farmers are absolutely critical to everything that we do, okay? So we work very, very closely with farmers, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, Crowley Consultants, local agri uh, consultants based in Clarendon, uh, Padge Connor Operation Group, the local authority, Kerry County Council, uh, are also in our operation group. Just a bit of background. So guys, these projects, I said a little bit about it, it's locally led. So the idea is that we have the flexibility under our project to devise work plans on the ground for the farmers, okay? Now, this was the first tranche of locally led projects that were brought in. So we're not the only agri-environmental project in the country. There's a number of them. So you'd probably be familiar with some of the bigger ones like the Pearl Muscle Project. Um, so while we're kind of the poor relation, we only got 950,000 in funding for a four-year project. Uh, they would have got 10 million for a five-year project, or the Hen Harrier project would have got 25 million for the uh, conservation and to bring on the, the numbers for the Hen Harrier. So there's a number of different EIP projects running up and down the country. Okay, so we're running one of them. And there's been a lot more edits since. Does that make sense? Yeah, keep nodding at me, really, that's whether you're following me or not. <laughs> okay. So, guys, just a small bit of background for you now, because I know you all want to hear about the border gender and what we're doing, but I just want to give you a small bit of background as well on why and how this came to be part of our project. Our project definitely was to improving the sustainability and the economic viability of farming. Okay? So to break that down, it really is to look at how we can keep farmers farming because all this land is managed land and it's producing an awful lot outside of production. It's water, it's carbon storage, it's a recreation community. There's an awful lot coming from these areas of land, not just you know the land or the beef. Okay. And um, then we said we do this through developing practical. Now, I don't know if everything we're doing is practical, but we're trying to de develop practical, achievable actions. There's no point us coming up with a plan with a farmer if it's not going to work. Okay. And um, innovative solutions has to be things that haven't been done before. And it's all to improve the conditions of the habitats. So everything that's there, guys, right? all the things that you find in the ground, the blanket bog, the wet heat and the dry heat, because that's predominantly what we're working on. Um, in the Gulf Reeds. So it's all protected, guys. It's all designated land, okay? Um, and it's working, obviously, as I said, and I said another thousand times, in close conjunction with the farmers. So I hope that all makes sense, okay? So again, guys, because I often kind of get weird because until I came into this whole kind of area of work, a lot of the language would go totally over my head. I'd be like, oh, what is that? So we expect people to know a lot of what we're talking about. So habitat is a place where plants and animals live and grow. 
Does that make sense as well? Yeah. So these habitats, uh, this, these places we're talking about, they are protected under Irish European legislation. Okay. And then it's supposed to have everything that those plants and animals need to, to survive. Okay. And we know, guys, and this is not just the farmers and the Gilgory Beaks either. All farmers, we know that, are challenged. Um, but I suppose mountainous areas, and we know this from talking to all our colleagues in Wicklow, in Connemara, in Mayo, and we have lots of great support here on the, today from Connemara and Mayo, and the lads from Donegal came down as well, so if they're facing you, make the journey. Um, but guys, it, it's challenging, all this mountain land, and uh, the terrain, the climate, we're looking at like, much wetter conditions, we know that, and drier, probably hotter summers, succession issues. We talk an awful lot about that, who's going to take over, who's going to continue doing the hard work that needs to be done. Um, economically unviable labour intensive practices because everyone knows when it's time to go get the sheep to bring them down. It's not easy guys, these are wide open areas so that the sheep could travel and travel and travel because there's nothing to stop them from travelling. Um, and obviously then the little reasons that will be challenging as well because we have huge numbers of recreational users. And when I say huge numbers, we are talking um, just under 2018, just under 238,000 visitors access to the little leaks. Okay, so if you put that in your head, cell, it's that's just under a quarter of a million people. Okay, so it's a huge challenge. So there you go, guys, just in case anybody doubts me when I talk about the terrain being challenging. That is challenging terrain. Because sheep lads just don't take as much notice as we do of going into the most awful spots on the mountain. Um, so obviously, we need everybody to work together to continue to be able to farm these areas. Okay. So we also said it's about creating a positive outreach program. There is no point us working away on our locally led project with our few farmers and not telling anybody what we're doing or why we're doing it. It's very important for us to tell people what we're doing. So we do an awful lot of that work. Um, raising awareness of the special area of conservation, designation, and telling everyone about the protected habitats of the species in breeds. And it's all of course again to prevent that further habitat damage due to the increased recreational pressures. All right. So we set up different systems to do that, a landowner ranger system. So a bit like rangers that you'd be familiar with, they say like in the national park, um, but it's landowners that are doing it and trail them into the forks. Okay. So that gives you an idea, guys. People literally walk all over the place. All right. Lots of numbers. You're all with me? Yeah. I'm sure you're really not your head. <laughs> I think he thinks I'm gonna kill him if he doesn't agree with everything I say. So guys, the map now uh, just gives you an idea of the scale of it, okay? So we're working. Now, it's what's very important to note here, guys, is we run a small pilot project. So we are working within this area that you see in red, all the designated area, all that area is about 10,000 hectares, and most of it is designated, especially for conservation. But we've only taken in small areas of land within that, because obviously we would not have a budget to bring in all the farms in that area, okay? But what we do know is when we opened up the project, there was a huge, and I mean, we were inundated with applications from farmers on the ground wanting to come to be part of the project, which is great, it's really, really positive. Okay, so again, I've said this already, and I'll say it a few more times, it all does come under the Clarny National Park, the Gilcoy Reeks, and the Clare River Catchment, so that's the official name of the Special Area Conservation. Okay, so, and this is important, guys, as well, like, because people say, oh, sure, look, farmers are getting money all the time, and they're getting money for nothing. I hear all this kind of thing, and I have to take lots of deep breaths, lads, and I don't do yoga, but, you know, people make comments like that, so I kind of go, yeah, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. But we know, guys, that quite is important to keep people living and working in these areas, okay? And we know this, there was a profile, an all-Irish profile, done, a study highlighting the strategic importance of upland areas, all right? Um, and they said maintaining vibrant upland farming communities is important, not just in social economic terms, but in respect of conservation and biodiversity. And then they said very importantly, it's necessary to link landscape conservation to community development, and that's in the European Landscape Convention. So basically, guys, if we don't have people working and living in these areas, there's going to be nothing happening in these areas, and we'll have no one to manage the land. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're like, would you get on to the road and <laughs> oh, I'm getting there. So guys, our project, a bit of background, it's a hybrid results-based, okay? So what does that mean? It means that we have two different measures or two different interventions, right? So one is results-based. So it's all about incentivising farmers to do things on the ground, okay? So if they have good quality habitat, they get paid accordingly, okay? The tents are quite low, uh, again, because the land that parcels we took in were quite small. We do not have a huge budget, unfortunately. 
but we were just again as a test to see would it work okay so obviously the more you have in terms of your habitat quality the higher your payment is so it's a banded system so if there's no payment for a score of zero to three how do we do this we walk the land every year our project ecologist works part-time we're a very small team and she works part-time she walks through all of the land and she does um, a peatland score um, and that's the farmers will be trained up as well now how we derive those scores and what those scores mean okay but basically it's an annual score that we do and it's all about improvement the land won't improve very quickly guys over time obviously in the uplands it does take longer so what we do as well then is we have another measure or another intervention and it's actions so if you have rhododendron on your land that could be bringing down your score if you have a significant infestation so what do we do we support the farmers in to actually try and manage the rhododendron or you might have a bracken issue on your land where the bracken is encroaching and taking over so we try to support the farmers to deal with that does that make sense so the two are very much linked because results happen slowly but bring on the score to increase the payment support the farmer this is a big part of it okay so the results based it, it, it's just all about what's on the ground okay and um, but it's incentivizing the farmers so it's looking at the habitat condition the landscape value and the richness of the biodiversity okay so obviously guys if the farmer decided yeah i'm going to burn all this area this area is worked out that's not going to leave the area probably in good condition if it's a really severe, uncontrolled burn. You know, so that could really impact on things like moss layer, which is very important in these upland areas. So if things like that happen, that could be something as well that could bring down the score. Does that make sense? Okay. So the priorities are obviously the improvement of the way you try to keep that above. Um, and you would work plans. So at the moment now, we're bringing in all the farmers these days, and we're sitting down, we're doing a review of everything that was done for the last 12 months. And we're planning for next year to write up the new plans. And we're doing it, guys, with the colleges as well as the private landowners that we brought in. Okay. And the big part about it is it's trying to get all of the colleges, obviously, as well, to work together. It's very, very important. So there's a fair bit of work in it, but it has to be done in this way because everybody's farm is the same. And we feel very strongly that having a generic kind of a, a, a plan in place wouldn't work because the issues one farmer might have, the next farmer won't have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So this is an idea then just to bring in the biosphere. Uh, so you can see our area there, tiny in the middle of the red. Okay, so that's the, we get the ECAP block, the project boundary area. You have the much wider area than the biosphere boundary and then you have the SEC boundary. Yeah, so it gives you an idea of huge tracts of land there and they're working very small pieces, but maybe very small pieces that again then could be burned. Um, okay, so what are the key actions? This is an interesting bit of background, so I'll quickly run through these. Uh, Bracken or farm management. So why we take care of it? Well, it can shade out all the other um, vegetation and it can become really extensive and a real problem. Uh, what are we doing? Well, there's a number of, of different measures that we're doing um, for heather and, uh, and bracken when it comes to these in Kent. But the middle picture there, guys, is a little robot that we brought up the mountain, I think it was last February. And it's actually, a, 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 it's kind of on tracks. We brought it way up the side of one of the colleges where there's very degenerate heather. We could have brought it into lowland fields, you know, to do some topping. We knew it would work, but we want to see would it travel the really rough, open ground, go across the rocky ground, up into that difficult terrain. And it did. Um, and now we're going to have to go back and look to see what's coming there now instead. Is the heather starting to now shoot and come forward again, or is there too much brash left afterwards? So again, it's about checking everything, trying everything, see what's working. Um, and we brought in cattle as well for vegetation management, guys. So there hasn't been cattle in a lot of these areas now for a long time. It's predominantly sheep in the middle of the reeds. And the reason we brought in the cattle was to graze down a lot of the time, to raise down the fanon, it's called locally, millennia, puppy more grass, okay? Because cattle will eat for much longer than sheep. So we're bringing in them there for a couple of weeks when they do some grazing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So cattle are very important um, to have there as well. Um, so there was a few little things that we're doing. So guys, and, and the bracken, I'll say that as well, just to give you a bit of context, on the bracken, we're not just spraying um, the, the bracken, we tried a few different measures as well. Cattle will trample bracken. Now, if it's too dense and too thick, they don't like going into it, which is fine, because we wouldn't like only walking through it ourselves if it's too dense and too thick. Um, so we try it, just to see if we encourage them going in there to put in mineral leaks and things like that in there. We also uh, cut our uh, bracken areas where and um, might be close to water course, we're cutting it back, it has to be cut twice a year, uh, um, every year for a couple of years to, to, to reduce it. And um, that's having an impact as well. So trying ranges of different measures. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So guys, I suppose big thing now on the road in is we had to map all of the dental across a range of sites. Okay? And what Therese mentioned earlier on about getting the infestation level, we had to look at the infestation level. If you don't know what you have, you can't possibly manage it. Okay? So we're very fortunate. We got a fourth year student who wanted to do a placement. <laughs> and the poor girl, I'd say she's caught in the sense, but she came to us for her fourth year. And we said, well, if you're willing to do some mapping of rural Denver. So she did. And she qualified. She graduated from the college. And then we said, hmm, there's more areas that need to be mapped yet. So we put out a tender. And that girl actually came in, Cathy Ahern, I said, not Cathy for her hard work. And she got all these areas mapped for us. Okay, so she did a significant amount of work. Because, guys, we are a very small project team. So myself, part of the college, part of the district. But you can see, guys, here, I don't know if you can see it quite clearly there, there's one slide there, 30 eye. And you can see there that like that site alone by itself has got all the different infestation levels, but it's got just over 45 hectares of level four infestation level. So that's really severe infestation level. And altogether that site is something like about 147 um, hectares of bracken cover. And that's just one site. So it's a bit scary, but sure, if you didn't have a challenge, that's why we don't want. <laughs> okay. So we have to really then prioritise area for treatment. And everything that Trey said is what we're taking into account. We're trying to look at best practice and we're kind of saying, where's the seed source? Where's it starting to spray out? And should we just knock it back or should we take out the flower leaves? Okay, and I know the number of farms that are here today, they're well briefed now on how they're doing it. Okay, so that's really important. You have to map it because then you have to see, did it work afterwards? Did we knock it out? You know, if you haven't mapped it in the first place, you have no idea what you've done. And again, it's to have the records for down the road. Because one of the biggest challenges of our project, as well as we're obviously around for four years, five years now we get an extension, um, but that's not going to be long enough. We only probably get the phase one, maybe phase two done across a few sites. So that's a huge challenge. We get a little bit of work done, but there's going to be a hell of a lot more that, that needs to be done. And at the moment, there's no national system in place or national scheme in place for dealing with rural dental planting. And that's a huge problem because we know from traveling into other areas, there's no, there's very little really that can be done unless there's a project like this operating. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's something I don't want to scare you, you know, that you all go in and floods of tears come, there's no help to get rid of it. Uh, it's just guys, we, we just need to probably make a little bit more noise about it because it's not going to stop growing because we don't have money to put into it. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So uh, just to give you a bit more or less of this because again, like, we use the, the level of infestation, so we said, right, well, why is a level one? There's no rural gender, happy days, have a party. Number two is slight. And anyone that has any bit coming through, that there's only one or two rural gender, I'm like, get on it now. Do it now. Do it straight away before it starts flowering. Take it out, get rid of it, treat it, make it a priority. Moderate is number three. Uh, four is severe. And then five is very severe. Um, so that's just to give you an idea. But that's where we take into account as well the frequency of the plants, um, their age, and whether they're old enough to, to flower and succeed. So that's what you're considering at the whole time. So that's the way we map everything. <laughs> and um, that informs how work plans every year. Does that make sense? I see colour there making notes. There might be even screen colour in it. What? <laughs> you have it? Good. <laughs> um, so, guys, yeah, this is just a little bit more of a synopsis of where we are. Um, and this is just the breakdown so we can keep track of what we're doing across all our sites. But when we add up the total of our cover on the two sites we brought in, um, the total area there is um, under, uh, under rhododendron that has rhododendron, it's 300 hectares, all right? And under management at the moment, we have 131, yeah. right? So we have a bit of a ways to go. And a lot of it is down to manpower and resources, okay? So Trey has mentioned a few of these things as well. Training. Um, Training is absolutely critical, guys, because we know from talking to various different farmers, they've tried different things. They've tried burning, they've tried cutting, they've tried uh, foliar spraying, and obviously we know things, some things work better than others, okay? So training. But even alone, guys, on doing the pesticide, the NASDAQ um, training course, the applicator course, for use of herbicides, that's critically important. A lot of our farmers didn't get the course done, so that was one of the first things that we had to do. And we weren't just looking at, you know, it's very important to get it done and tick a box. It's more, guys, because we know there's health implications to using these as well, and we know there's environmental um, implications as well. So that was a really important part of the training that we did with the farmers, okay? So that has to be part of it going forward. You can't just go away. Training is critical. And it's not just training in terms of doing that course, 
but it's also what's the PPE that's required? Okay, now we were kind of covering it for the bracket amount, which is well, but again, guys, I know that's a bit of an exaggeration there. No, the level of uh, dressing up you'll be doing, but we have to consider these things, you know. Uh, but gloves obviously would be basic, um, masks, and um, we put a blue dye in our spray as well. It's very helpful to see what you've done and what you haven't done. But the, the good fun of that macro dye that we do is bright blue. Once it gets on the clothes, guys, you know, you can see it from a long way away, okay? So, and then obviously we had to do a huge amount of work. What is the best system of, of treatment? And as if you're looking at a single stem or gender, you nearly shout in hallelujah, you know, because it's easy to treat, it's easy to get in there. But anything that's been cut before, if it's multi stem if it was burnt before, they are nightmarish, tricky little things to do, okay? Um, so one thing that we'll be doing now going forward is we're going to have chainsaw training because it's not all straightforward about doing the same treatment method, which is mostly what we do. We will have to use the stone treatment method as well for the more extensive areas of road gender. So learning the how and the why. And we have one of our experts here today, and I think he's there in the picture actually. Mick, I told you I'd embarrass you, Mick. And um, <laughs> Mick is one of our... More than that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't chance me, Mick. <laughs> but um, Mick, guys, I'm, I'm going to point out to Mick, especially because uh, Mick has his chainsaw and he has his insurance and his training and all his appropriate PPE for using a chainsaw because it's quite different to the stem treatment. But Mick's here more sides, guys, by himself, and I think he must just dream about rural dendron and have serious hatred of it because he's just eradicated so much of it single-handedly. It's absolutely incredible. But without me, we'd be lost actually in a few sites. So Mick just wants to embarrass you by thanking you. <laughs> um, but again, guys, we've had trees in to talk to our farmers and our landowners, you know, to give a little bit of background on what are the different systems and methods treatment. And this is very important, to learn the how and the why. Okay. Um, so trees, I think we just like freezing her. Uh, because that night, I remember that, in the, the hall, we were absolutely blue with cold, okay? But again, guys, it's, it's very important, okay? So I suppose the scale of the challenge, when I've given you the kind of the figures there of the road gender cover that we know we have for the areas that we have mapped, not every farmer has come on board with us, unfortunately, some haven't, and that's not really fair on the farmers that are trying everything to get rid of it and working very well to get rid of it. We need everybody on board. So it needs to be that whole landscape approach to take into it as well, okay? Um, and to raise into this as well, what do you do afterwards? And we know we're different borns, I think it's got one of the highest calorific values of all the, the timbers. So um, we have been kind of telling people they can use it for firewood uh, because we've all got to be taken away from sites and being left there, you know? Because again, if it's left there, it could be an actual uh, a potential source for a wildfire, okay? So you can see, guys, the amount of brash, like, it's no joke at all, okay? But there's nothing nicer than on a really horrible cold day than actually having a little fire. Now, these are the other people, guys, I want to point to today. So when we decided and we talked to our farmers, they were like, Trish, I'm working. Or Trish, I'm so busy. Trish, oh, I can't do it by myself. There's no way I get through it. It's too much for me, okay? So what we did in the course of our speaking to all our farmers and our landowners in the entire area, we kind of put a shout out and said, who would be available for some part-time work, okay? So we decided to set up these collective groups. So it's basically encouraging people to come together. It'd be like me kidnapping you all now, bringing you all out to site, giving you all the gear, a bit of training, and saying, right guys, this is how you're going to do it. We get through a hell of a lot more working together than one of us individually. That's common sense, isn't it? Okay, so we brought uh, a few guys, not all farmers and landowners, some people that have seasonal employment, um, and we brought them together. And they are working phenomenally well together and they are also supporting us to get through the site. And some farmers are working by themselves, some employ maybe an extra neighbour to come in and help them. But we got the guys here to come in, okay? Mick, Noel and Pat and uh, the three of them guys. The dynamic there is socially between them because they're working in an open area. They don't have too far to travel to work. If they've got a cow they'll take it home or if they've got, you know, they don't have to work five days a week for someone sticking around baiting them to come to work and be on time. You know, there's a bit of flexibility, they can come in. And they're working so well together. So I would say out of all the things that we've done on the project, bringing people to work together like this in a group is working really, really well together. Okay, does that make sense? So the social side of it, guys, that they're doing it correctly environmentally. They're not ending up using hundreds of meters of, of, of uh, herbicide and damaging everything else. They're still treating it, they're getting in there, environmentally they're doing the right way, socially, there's a great dynamic between them. 
um, and economically. That's only going into the local area. We could employ contractors, we would get our hands on contractors. It's very hard to try and get people now because we don't have a lot of people that are agreeable to do the physically demanding, challenging work like this. Okay, so providing work for the local people. It's going to leave a legacy there, guys. So instead of just having a contractor come in to do the work and go away afterwards after having nothing left, these guys now can train other people how to do it. They can advise other people how they have been doing it themselves. Does that make sense? So there they are, guys. And um, again, it, it works really, really well. Okay. And I suppose when we talk about sustainability, and I hate using that word because it's so overused and bashed around the place. But like, when you look at it, guys, it's when you go back into the local economy, it's local, it's been local employment, environmentally reduced the right way, and the social aspect as well is so important because it's a great dynamic between them. Okay. Does that make sense? So I think that's very important. So I would say to anyone, and I know I've been talking to the lads about kind of setting up groups like this. If you have somebody in the local community that can coordinate an effort like this, you will get huge results from it. Okay? Because it is tough work, guys, and that can't be underestimated. But we know that, like I said, you know, having a gang doing it together is much easier than trying to manage it by yourself. Okay. So we think that is definitely the way to go. Um again, I'll go back to this now because this is one of the sites. So we kind of said, right, with all this brash. It's not going to look terribly nice in these scenic uh, high value community areas. If you're left with loads of photogenic brush, maybe then you could have new growth coming up. So I went on to my dear brother, who I torment every now and again, to do things for me. He can't say no to me, that's his busy house. So um, we said we, we do want to be born either on the ground, because we would be actually damaging the habitat. We'd be taking away this lovely moss layer that you would find in a lot of these sites, these witty, dry little blanket bog areas. Okay? So we got a little boring frame made up, very lightweight frame, which break it up in parts, take it away, bring it to where you want it. And we know that there's very few farmers in the country, guys, that won't have some corrugated sheets hanging around the place. Okay. So we said we'd try burning it on top of the frame. Okay. So we wouldn't be left with all this brash afterwards. People thought we were insane, I think, as they drove by, they're kind of gone, they're gonna burn the mountain down. But we were left then afterwards with very little. And the only constraint we had was the number of hours in the day. But if we burnt too much, we'd be left with loads of, of, of hot ash afterwards. So what we're curious about now is if this could be maybe used as fertilizer, or we're not too sure what could be used to something like a charcoal. Okay. So it's something we're going to try and explore a bit more. But again, guys, looking at that, and that could be removed from site very quickly, because we considered mulching as well. We were afraid with mulching it, what would you do with the mulch? You'd be left with piles of mulch around the place. And then would you have viable seeds inside the mulch? So we figured burning would be a better way to go, okay? So this is something that we're doing. Again, guys, like Trey said, having a clear site, you know, tidying up afterwards, this you can put away and it's dealt with and it's done and it's, it's taken care of, okay? It's very important. Uh, because again, coming back to do the phase two, you know, it, it's going to be very important. Um, so look, they say innovation, I said it might be crazy, but guys, it seems to be working. And the upside of it as well is on a cold, miserable, wet all day, you might not be able to do any treatment for rhododendron. You can do the, 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 the clearing up instead. Okay. And on a cold, horrible day, I tell you that you'd be damn glad of that fire. Okay. So um, I suppose yes, Trace has already said this as well. It's not a once off, it needs to be carried out over a number of years and will require a strategic uh, plan and resources. And I'm not just talking about resources in terms of money, it's great to have money, but you can sometimes throw all the money in the world at it and you still can't get the people to do it. So I think being embedded in the community, going down that route, is probably far more effective. Okay. So I'm going to plug here and also report it. We're on McGillicreeksCarry.com, that's our website. Or you can follow us on Facebook for anyone that's on Facebook here today. Be friends, please, thanks. And uh, just to, good news, guys. So I, I always like a bit of good news. We have been nominated for the International Mountain Protection Award by the International Climate and Mountain Federation. Okay, so that's an international competition, and um, so we have all the big players there at the table, from the Himalayas to the Alps to the Pennines to name any mountain range you want in the world. They're all in for this award. We've been nominated for that award. So I'd say follow us, and hopefully we'll have some good news soon. And again, guys, I must say, like a lot of the being nominated in anyway, get through that far. It's great news to get that far. Well, we'll get part of it. But that's only down to the support of the people that we're working with on the ground, uh, particularly the farmers, but also the agency as well. Okay. So thank you very much, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you haven't drifted off to sleep. And uh, that's it.
Hello, uh, my name is Tim Cahalan. I have been working on the rhododendron problem in the Clarny area for a number of years. So today I'm going to talk to you about when it was brought in and we look at some of the methods uh, we might use to get rid of problematic and unwanted rhododendron plants you might have on your property or in your gardens. So rhododendron was brought into the Clarny area around the late 19th century from the Iberian Peninsula of Western Spain and Portugal. And uh, in this area, it found uh, its perfect environment to uh, proliferate and spread um, due to our mild climate and um, our damp, heavy acidic soils um, provides the perfect conditions for the plant to thrive and grow and spread. So there's a number of reasons why rhododendron is so invasive and so why it uh, spreads so rapidly. Um, one of the main reasons is it's a prolific uh, producer of seed. Uh, it starts producing these uh, seed capsules from the age of uh, 10 to 12 years of age when the plant is that around that age and uh, it, it produces these uh, flower heads in in uh, late May or June and um, eventually the petals fall off it and uh, we're left with these seed heads and um, eventually from November to January these capsules open and the seeds start spreading so each one of these capsules produces between three and seven thousand seeds and each one is a potential plant one of the other reasons why it's uh, so invasive, its uh, leaves are toxic and um, grazing animals don't eat it. So it gives it, it also gives it that competitive advantage um, over other plants that may be grazed upon by deer and other grazing animals. So to treat rhododendron is quite, uh, is quite a simple process. Um, the main method we use is uh, stem treatment. So the way that works are, is cuts are made at the base of the plant, ensuring it's done below the last leaf. The herbicide then is taken up by the sap in the plant into the leaves and uh, eventually back down into the roots and completes, completely kills the plant. Um, this system, this method can be used all year round. Um, if it's done in the winter period, it, 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 it will take a long time for the plant to die off. It may be uh, April or May before the plant is completely killed off. In the summer, the, the process is a lot sooner. So it's quite simple, just clear to the base of the plant. A plant about this size, you just make it cut at either side of the plant and you apply your herbicide into the cut. Again, with a smaller plant like this, again, two cuts. The herbicide that we're using is a solution of glyphosate uh, for a plant this size, a 5% or a 1 in 20 solution is uh, is enough for larger plants uh, going right up to the larger the biggest rhododendron you, you might get um, a stronger solution will be required uh, uh, 14% or a, a 1 in 7 solution the colour blue that you see on the plant is a uh, it's just a marker dye. It's a it's a non toxic marker dye that we mix in with the with the herbicide just to um, indicate that the plant has been treated.
And so I think you can see from uh, Tim's work how intricate and how precise you really have to be to eradicate a rhododendron plant. Um, and as uh, Therese said earlier, it's will to live. It's, it's tough. But um, uh, Tricia, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. And I think it shows the fact that you were inundated on that innovation project, shows the appetite and uh, often farmers, and particularly at the moment, the fingers being pointed at the farming sector for not wanting to get involved and not wanting to protect the environment. But it just goes to show the appetite that was there to be involved. And hopefully, if one of the many messages that goes out from this conference is hopefully we can see that project extended and maybe on into the future again, because there's huge, huge merit in it. Uh, but I'm going to bring up one of the farmers who is involved in that project. That is Flora McCarthy. And uh, just give me one second here, because Flora is a bit taller than I am. I'm going to give you this one. Yeah. Yeah, does this one work? It does indeed. Your one works as well. Excellent. Well, Flora McCarthy, I suppose the, the hardest question first. Um, you're obviously a, a farmer involved in the, the innovation project uh, involved in the McGillicuddy Reeks. You're also, of course, the uh, chair of the IFA's National Hill Farming Committee as well. I suppose, firstly, Flora, for people who aren't familiar with you, um, tell us a little bit about the farm and how long you've been farming there. I suppose I've been farming all my life, you see, but, but uh, I bought my mother's farm about 14 years ago and uh, I realised straight away that I had made a farm with Jordan in them. Well, maybe I didn't realise initially how big the problem was. I was, I was at one part from me, maybe the first attempt I made at controlling the Jordan in them had been underneath a pork. So I might have abandoned me and decided to go to with a better option than controlling what I them. So I, I mean, can't imagine why. I, I can't believe really myself, so I don't fully understand that, but uh, I think most people here will understand it. So I in my own family, we were like 17 miles from the Lord in them there. So uh, when Trish said to me she could get contacts to do it, I don't think she actually appreciates, uh, you know, we as individual farmers, and I don't think the department understands it either. That we as individual farmers couldn't achieve what's been done on the DIP project because there's five contacts on my farm at, at different times uh, controlling the roadhouse. They've done a massive job, but I, as an individual farmer, wouldn't be able to get the five million people and motivate them. So, I mean, the, the, the motivation I don't think people and uh, they don't understand the roughness of the terrain, the difficulties with the terrain, and people think there's a way of roadhouse there, and there actually is. You can, you can give days there because I'm just going to go to spray in one hollow, you go over the hill down in the next hollow, and there are even bigger amounts of roads there. And I actually dread to see when I travel countrywide because we were aware of it, to realize what is the situation. And uh, as Ashley has said, I'm an obvious as well. And uh, I don't think the appreciation has been in the department, the issue that the road and are creating. We have other problems with other invasive pieces like Belden. Don't look down all the way on the scale of the trade because the road are also priceless to sheep. You know, I mean, if you move sheep off of sheep from their uh, pressure, they are needed the road in them, and that's it. So, if you leave your land to take them off in the winter, to have them back on in the spring, they'll see the, they'll see the fresh corn in the road, and they go to eat them. And not, I'm, not, I'm not one of that number of farmers who are beginning to have problems in, in the weeks where we are with the road. So, the, 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 the road is a massive problem. And, uh, and how about the other impacts? I mean, in terms of obviously there's an impact on your livestock, but in terms of the, the availability of land to actually work with as well. Oh, well, obviously, and uh, I mean, at the moment, as I was saying, you think every farmer gets out of bed in the morning to do damage to the environment. We actually get out of bed in the morning to make a living like everybody else, and we respond, we respond to the incentives that are there, and that's the problem now with the cap. Now, the cap, we, and the cap, and was, and I think people aren't taking into consideration. The next generation of farmers, like my own family, you know, they're, they're, a different, they're a different animal to the, the people that are farming today. Every five years is changing. What we have now is professional, professional farmers, with small farms. Take my own family, they're educated. I guess school, we leave leaving out. But let's say they're, they're leaving school now with degrees and, and uh, they're in jobs. They're, you know, in, if, it, if the farming isn't viable, they just will cease, but they will respond. I would say that we can be down the next generation. They will do it. There's money in it, but they are going to be more, more you will see. People like us, of our age generation, are going to stay farming. We, the next generation won't take up the business. Like Trish has realised, we won't have farmers in the weeks. It's impossible. And uh, I don't think the cows are be realise either the amount of work that's involved. But it, it makes it, it, having an invasive species on your farm, it takes your cap payments, 
and uh, the way the new cabbage scrapes the shape of now with our people in the two more like the year the party book for it at the max manage that include capital works and all those works taking out invasive species is what we do in European. So what that's actually going to mean is there's going to be very little attack. If that actually comes to pass, the work that's been done by the EIP projects now to eliminate the problems that are around the hill areas will be incredibly harsh disease. Do you think they're going to roll it out to a bigger scale? I can tell you from this involvement in the EIP project that that is the way it's going to work. Do you think there'd be anything to be said for an all team bonding day from Leinster House to walk the reeks someday and they could really see what yes. the is? <laughs> well, no, just, uh, Ashley, you, you're, you're right. But even people that are coming down, even from, uh, from Dr. Trish now, people that are coming down, even from with an activity and all that, they actually don't appreciate the work that's being done. You know what I mean? They, they can't get their heads around the, the physical work that these individuals are doing. You know what I mean? Obviously, like you said, they're motivated and their work is a team. But you couldn't motivate your own family to do it. The individuals, it has worked exceptionally well in my site. I'm delighted with it because it has been our contractors. Yeah. Can you tell us about the, the methods that you've used to, to tackle rhododendron? Sorry, I, 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 I use no, I use no method because <laughs> these contractors have done it. And what have they? What have you seen yeah, from the reason? Just as the video has shown me, that's the way they've done it. It is time consuming. I did many hectares of rhododendron. I, I said fifty or sixty hectares. I'm not one hundred percent sure myself, but I know I did that. And they have in the space for over a year, for two years, two seasons. They've done massive work to control them. Uh, I'm delighted the project has gone so far. But what I do is these fellas that might be that haven't done the project and people that have come up the road, it looks like this opportunity won't be available to them. You know what I mean? I'm still, I, the, 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 the meeting was called. I said I would send black out of us from going in. In the staff, there was a bit of resistance to the project. I said if nobody else was going to join, I definitely was. But I wasn't going to. To, to, to block anyone else because I find one that for my mother's farm, right? But I don't live in that area, so I, I think there's locals wanted to do it at the time they didn't. So I actually finished up doing the project. Now it was a massive clamor to come in. But farmers like that are by the young, by the very nature, they want to see. But I myself was skeptical we good that would actually work. So, so I, I, I can't come here to the ANCA, but I, I knew the front walk right off. And it was just referring to, I was sitting there early in the morning, they said the National Park, I'd be in the of the National Park as well. And I would be hoping that the National Park would fully control the roads because our neighbours are our problem. So, I mean, uh, if I have roads, we the National Park have roads, we both have roads. So I, I, I think it comes back to you know what Tricia was saying mm -hmm. there about the need for a national rhododendron project as well. That yeah, something yeah. has to happen on a national scale. Yeah, that's what needs to happen to be on a shadow of doubt. And there are, I think the more people that look for that, then I mean, it's, it's, it's necessary because it would take me or going to Killary Harbour. Go to Donegal, you might want to only take water, roaders, you might think they're not like Tracy Hickens said in the morning, one or two roaders, but there is more. When you can see them off the road, you have a problem. Do you know what I mean? If you, if you don't see them, they can still be there. You, you're really having a problem that stage, it's, it's controllable. But the minute you can see bushes rolling in around the hill, there's a major problem in that hill. Because when you go in, you will find them small fields and every roader. So, and the terrain that they try on is difficult terrain. You can't go into big machinery, you know, you face all of the physical hardship of walking in. They're on ledges, it's not simple, it's not simple walk. So, yeah, so one of the contact position you talk about the physical walk because I haven't, but I, I, I try to control my own right and wasn't successful. But I actually didn't realize how unsuccessful I was until six months later and I see how two died. I actually thought I was very successful on the day when I was walking in it because I hadn't the die like the boys. And when, when, when I came back to six months later, so I see how, how big the problem I faced. But then the project arrived, so I just blew up. I know you, you said you were cynical about going in to, to join the, the project, but what was well, your impression and having worked with it now for the, the last few years, well, how have you found the project? What I was cynical about was what, what concerned the about was that, that Trish would be as of, you know, we'd better get people to walk and do the walk. You know what I mean? I see her in action today, I don't doubt that yeah, she would. I mean, and, and you did difficult train, mm -hmm. tough weather. I mean, uh, as I said, now the department, I, I don't know the name, because people have been out on the side there, and they see what's going on, they think it's simple enough. But I can assure people it's not simple walk. It's very difficult. Because even like Tracy said, as they were saying, the National Park, we just can't control them. My, my view of that is we can't just control them, we need to let the rent get them. You know, we have to stop with that. No, with that direction, because if we live, they, they, they are unbelievable. The spread is unbelievable. We can see it on individual farms how much they have taken up. And this is all happening in the space of 
Çünkü top da 100 numarayı seçildi long cycle. Çünkü long cycle ya. In 5 and 6 years they are making massive progress. So I would appear to have has influence. I mean, I have nothing here for Frank Nunes. He's the man that I will listen to. I mean, since there is this year, we'll show money at it. It is to create more than money to solve it. To create people to motivate people to go and actually do the physical work. Yeah, there has because to be the enthusiasm yeah, to want to see this through. Yeah. But I, I, I can assure everybody the farmers will buy into it. I mean, farmers will more into it. The way the cabbage uh, shaped farmers set out, obviously, number one, to make a living. But number two, we want to protect the environment. I, if, even if it didn't affect my cap payments, I don't want to have roses on my farm. I see what they're, they're doing to my farm. So I, I want to have a, a, a farm for your growth and that And that be, you know, I mean, you, you, might, you might say, you know, why would you be that determined? You know, I mean, you, nobody wants a weed on his farm. I, the, the obviously the project is concerned about film. I'm not as concerned because that's it. Uh, uh, um, we only grow on good land. It's easier to control. But the road in them seems to be widely solved. Okay, and look, if the innovation project hadn't started um, in the reeks, you know, what would you have seen happening? Well, I, I think we've seen any. Well, we, we won't see it in the reeks, maybe. We will see it in other areas where the road will just take over vast areas. There'll be 270 hectares of just road in them. And she, you can manage sheep because if sheep go into the road in them, they're lost. You know what I mean? If it is cover, I mean, you, you, where we have roaders, we have, like they said, you want to have, you want to have a, or the scrub light, you want to have sheep either. Because you can't get a sheep out of an area because there's still roaders. So what you have is total abandonment of that land. People moving back. But when the roaders and the areas get bigger, the spread will get faster. And if you, you would have farming, because by no choice, People just have to move back from farming because you can't gather sheep or anything over it. And, all that, and I don't think there's appreciation within the powers that be that all that, all that can manage that land. You see, within the cap now, there's a fierce movement against the people that are involved in the low income sectors, which are the suckers and the sheep. And we've talked about carbon secretion and all this. It's the buzzword at the moment. But the people that are being pushed out are the people, in theory, that are secreting the carbon. You know, this, that, we, we're going for more intensive agriculture. I mean, so when people say farmers aren't responding, they are responding to what's happening, but the, the money is the direction the money is being directed. If the money is directed away from the people that are involved in like sheep, which are low intensity, low, low profit, and suffering is the same, you're directing you're, you're direct the incentive away from the, 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 that way of farming. So all we are farming, I mean, and it's been separate into the pattern that we can change direction, say, four or five years. When people move away from this system of farming, like in the weeks, because there are farming, you won't get people to come back. It's in the simplest top on the tap, and they're, they're returning. Once they go, they go. Yeah, they go. and I think we see that from uh, Trisha's presentation as well. There's a social element to, you know, life on the, the mountains as well, mm -hmm. and the, the metal, the coming together, and, you know, this is all very, very important. Well, but to keep them, to keep them up in the weeks, farm, to keep them farm the hard. You need to keep a network of people there. You can, you can take a loss of certain amount of people, but you can't take them. It would last with abandonment. I even see in the space of 10 years, in my own situation, when we got a sheep, we had more and more neighbor sheep coming in 10 years ago, and we've been having more neighbor sheep coming today. But that tells me sheep create a natural boundary on the weeks where we're talking about fence. But if there's no sheep next to you, your sheep start going further. And uh, we're seeing that more and more. There's less, less people on the weeks, and, that's, and that, that creates its own problem. It creates a problem for the people that are left there as well, that are, that are trying to, to farm it. it it's a method, if the neighbor, if the neighbor's up in farming, you don't actually realize your sheep going over into their section of the hill, because if they are not gapping that section of the hill, your sheep will you realize they're there and they come back with the wool on them. You know, so it's, it's not like a farm will drive along, you can see it all during the weeks. It's different to terrain, some of it is unwalkable. You can't, you can't actually walk with people around the weeks, though. Just, you know, the dog scoot across the side of the cliff. A human can do it, but someone walk the ridge, but they're not fully falls off, unfortunately, and we don't hear any more about it. But that's the kind of terrain we're dealing with. It's difficult terrain. And uh, to keep people farming in regions is going to be a challenge. And to go to European level, uh, which I would have been in Antwerp Harbour, where the land will be bought up by the state, they're now trying to bring the farmers back in there to manage that land. So they, they realize they've got a true power of money at it. At the end of the day, it's very hard to manage the large tracts of land. So, like the National Park, we need a management plan. Because, you know, I mean, you have to have a plan to manage it. And Top Harbour is the best example on the continent. 
uh, why life is to, uh, um, the quality depth of why life is dropping out of there about two years ago because they can't make it over. They did have this lovely project with total state ownership. They found when they won big track land near the port, they couldn't manage it. But they're only people at the end of the day, the management are farmers. But obviously, they have to be incentivized to do it right. Because if, if farmers are told to do something wrong, obviously they're going to do it wrong. Because they, they don't know if you, the people that are advising us or incentivizing us have to be right. If they aren't, we are what we want. Well, Flora McCarthy, thank you so much for giving us an insight. Now we're going to take a, a very quick break, and uh, after that, we're going to be hearing from the National Parks and Wildlife Service. We're going to have a very special video, and we're going to be throwing it open for questions from the floor. And if anybody on Facebook Live wants to put in a question, feel free as well. Thank you. Now, next up today, we have Seamus Hassett, and Seamus is a regional manager with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And uh, among his responsibilities, and I'm sure he'll tell us a lot more about his own job when he comes up here, is the implementation and enforcement of the Wildlife Act, the Habitats and Birds Directive, management of state-owned nature reserves, and of course, the Killarney National Park. Um, he also uh, offers advice and to planning and other uh, authorities about the impacts of development applications and plans on biodiversity and they would make submissions on that, the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And also, of course, they take part in research and survey projects and uh, are in involved as well with education and uh, an advisory service to the public. So without further ado, I give you Seamus Hassett, Regional Manager with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Thank you, Ashley. I think you've covered it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, first off, I'd say that thank you, Jelda, for the invitation today and, and for everybody for attending. Um, from our context of the Peripheral Bowl, then when we've looked at the park, we were looking, the idea of today's conference is looking at outside the park and maybe trying to share with you some of our experiences and what we've learned over the last maybe 25, 30 years in relation to looking at the old Denver issue. So I think we kind of look at from where we started to where we are now. Um, and looking at the very onset of when Old Denver first started to be looked at here in 1963 64, when Dan Keller came here, um, it's hard to credit when he started cutting the Old Denver. It ended up in letters going to the Commissioner of Public Works and to ministers at the time for the destruction of the beautiful flora and plants that were growing in what was, I suppose, the, the Muckers estate at the time. So I think that our understanding, everybody's understanding of the, the, the plant itself has changed completely over the intervening years. Um, Dan got the trouble for buying the first chance on Canary National Park. So it's, it's, it's hard to credit where we, where we are now and the money and resources we've put into controlling it. So um, the public perception of beauty is still there. It is. It's an attractive flower, it's an attractive plant. But I suppose in reality, we're now realising from our Victorian I suppose beauty is where we're going and where we're going to end up if we don't continue to try and look at the problem and to try and treat the role of Denver in, in it, both in a local, regional and national context. And I think that the focus of today is trying to take it outside of the local context here and try and broaden it out into the more regional and then look at it on a national basis. So again, there's going to be an element of repetition, particularly when we're looking at, I suppose, a one topic subject over a number of speakers we're going to have an element of repetition in relation to biologies, distributions, treatment methods, and that kind of thing. So I'll skim through these slides fairly quickly. Um, Trace has covered these in quite detail, and Trish and Flora have actually looked at the idea of the treatment and the management of it and that kind of thing. So I said there's going to be an element of repetition. So you can read as quick as I can talk, so you can have a quick look at the points as we're going through them. Um, again, as Trace said earlier this morning, it's basically first into Britain in the 1700s into Ireland and has become a problem then similar to other plants that would have come in from the large houses or the old estates be it the likes of the giant hog weed up the country or the Malayan balsam or any of the other exotics I suppose looking at in general we look at what we call garden escapes and see how they become naturalised if you take somebody familiar with West Cork the fuchsia is the brand of West Cork again a garden escape quite quite pretty plant and the whole lot and everything else. Maybe not as troublesome as invasive or rodo, but again, it just gives you an idea of where plants get out, they're brought in for an ornamental purpose, once they get out of that and get into the wider countryside, 
Mount Greenshed, some of the Connemara people here, you'd be well familiar with the likes of Gunner and the giant Gruber, all the way up to Ackwell and along. So we've multiple issues nationwide in relation to invasive species, rodent being one of them, or rodent probably being the more dominant one of them on a national context. Again, traces cover the distribution with predominantly the Adriatic and across through the Iberian Peninsula and then back up here. We've gone through it all from everybody again, like Tim has covered in the video, again, trails has gone through with the basically the multi stem growth, thick leaves, how flowers at 10 to 12 years, and so on and so forth. Um, again, the seed production, the number of seeds per head, the, the root system, sorry, the root system being extensive, shallow, ideally acid rich soils, those bare seeding plots. So again, it's been covered in quite detail, so rather than me just kind of hashing over more the old ground again, I think you can read through it as we go along and we'll get to where we are currently. So again, aggressive colonizer, soil types, pH, sorry, I'll go back to give somebody a chance to read that if they wish. Um, really, really high seed producing, and that is a major issue, but it's a major problem. Um, it can be windborne, as Trey said, it can be carried by animals, it can be carried in water, so there's multiple distribution vectors for it, and it is problematic on that side of things. Uh, again, trace cover the, um, the life element of it and so on and so forth. So it will outcompete our native flora and fauna. So in relation to getting seedlings off the ground and getting out past the road up, it's a race to the top. And unfortunately, the road being a vigorous grower is going to trump or outbeat our native flora on those aspects of things. So um, picking up on the figures that Trace had mentioned, so Trace covered up to 2014, 16, that kind of thing. So picking on from there between 2016 and 2020, we have 1.6 million spent on rhododendrons here in the Southwest. And that will include the majority of money being spent in Clarion National Park and some in our sister reserve in Glengarriff. This year we have 530,000, including that, allocated to treat with rhododendron within Clarion National Park. That's targeting just in excess of 100, 125 hectares of annex or priority habitat within the park. And that's been predominantly done in contract. We've suffered a little bit in the last two years in relation to our volunteer side of things, particularly with COVID. Um, there's been a strong history of volunteers and within Clary National Park, going back to the days of groundwork, up to 2009, Volunteer Service International, and what we call, I suppose, our um, Interns. There were foreign students who would come for eight or nine weeks at a time and would work in small groups and continue with our very local and very active mountain metal uh, parties here in Clary National Park. But we've lost that international and the student participation for the last few years of COVID, and that has certainly impacted on some of our maintenance sweeps within some of the, the different management zones within the park. Um, thankfully, I suppose this year with the, the the, I suppose more regulation of the COVID restrictions, or whether we were able to get back into our property. They did some work on private property last year where we were able to facilitate them being state organization, being adherent to the government guidelines. They had more latitude, I suppose, working on private properties. So we're good, delighted to have them back in this year. And again, I'd like to acknowledge throughout the years, all the volunteers um, from the very onset of all the work that's been done in the park, our own staff, do an element of work, but we couldn't do it all on our own. It's a hugely labor intensive, as Flora pointed out. Um, it's a massive resource draw, and the volunteers do certainly help and contribute towards the works we do. So basically, our ongoing program of works is basically the initial clearance and follow-up of maintenance work by contractors, the ongoing maintenance work by volunteers, students, contractors, and MPWS own staff, and the ongoing work by MPWS staff, including coordinating research and monitoring. And this kind of brings us on to where we are now. We, over the last two years, we've commissioned an independent review of the rhododendron treatment within Clarny National Park. We've had our, literally, literally the last month we've received our first draft of that review, and that's currently being digested, I think, here internally. And I think we're fairly happy with the review in the sense it, it's coming out saying we are where we are, kind of looking at the evolved or the evolution of the treatment methods and that kind of thing. So. Once that has, I suppose, been reviewed and discussed, we will then look at maybe progressing on from there to our next step. So in relation to the management within the park, there's approximately 3,500 hectares of Clary National Park that are infested or have rhododendron into varying degrees of levels of infestation or densities. 
So we've divided those into 71 management zones. Out of those 71 management zones, there's 53 of them under active management, which equates about 2,200 hectares. The monitoring of those sites will now fall to the conservation rangers. And I think under stewardship, my colleague Danny O'Keefe was here today, each of the rangers have been given a number of individual plots. So it will no longer be the preserve of any one staff member that we intend to have everybody within the park familiar with the park geographically and with the levels of rhododendron within the park. So over a number of years, the rangers will rotate through these plots. So far, I say I plot one to five this year. In year three, I have a plot six to eight. So everybody will get to know the park geographically, where the problems are, and the levels of rhododendron density in it. We're looking to devise um, a more detailed and scientific, scientifically robust monitoring uh, program within the park. And we've been very good at doing work up to this, but we've probably been, been a little bit on the weaker side of recording the minutiae of what we are doing. So we, for example, some of the rangers on their, on, their, on their ordinary working day may treat a number of rhododendron plants in an area. We may not have documented it. We need to get better at that documentation and building up our own bigger picture of it. Uh, we look at some of the, the idea of the treatment, I think, is, is fairly nailed down at this stage, and the follow-up inspections, I think, was something we'll come to. The monitoring is going to, is going to be carried out by the rangers that they assign blocks, and our predominant time for monitoring is going to be in the autumn and spring. And again, as Flora has pointed out, the, the likes of when the bracken dies back, that's when you'll see your seedlings emerging. So ideally, the height of summer, when you do have that, that more vigorous growth, you are going to miss seedlings. So for somebody walking in transect, and we would count maybe 15 meters either side, you're covering a 30 meter sway. To do that and maybe miss seedlings five and 10 meters out from you would skew your results. So we just need to do it at the right time of the year. We're GPSing the spots, so they will all be layered onto a GIS system. And I'll show you the examples of this as we go through in a couple of moments. Um, sorry. Um, so, for as we say, these are the areas that are managed at the moment. So, when you're looking at the park, the areas here, they're the lakes. So, obviously, there are parts that we're not going to monitor for all the at the moment, unless it starts to get very quiet in place. <laughs> the lighter blue areas are all the areas that are monitored, and the area here, the kind of mustard colour, are areas that aren't monitored. So, the likes of, we say, Inchfallon, Brown Island, maybe some of the parkland, the domain land in around Knock Weir, um, this is going to come across back over to Tobin's, just joining on to Tobin's here. And the upper part here, the top of Shetty, going out across Purple Mountain. They're not act under active monitoring at the moment. So the areas that are monitored are walked by the conservation rangers, they're mapped, and um, we we'll score our seedlings, saplings, plants, basically said working a 30 meter band. So they'll be using handheld GPS devices to systematically record them. We'll build in the knowledge to restore those, map them, transfer them across onto something like this. So this is Oak Island, and this is one of the ranges. The blue area is the track we would have walked. So that's his GPS track around the heathland or the, the, um, the more open areas of Oak Island. So that's one of our management zones. So the little plot here, oops, sorry, apologies, wrong button. Um, the little plot here will form its own management zone. So the, the management zone is in within the red. So this is the survey track and the number of plants that we recorded within that survey track. So each of those will be GPSed. When we come around to putting out a commercial contract, we will look at these areas. We will classify the plants then as to whether they're flowering, flowering and seed bearing, whether they're maintenance, whether there's no flowers. So that will allow us then to prioritize areas in relation to our commercial activity, our commercial contract awards. So that's what's going to determine it. The, here's Derry Cunaghy, um, and again, you can see the management zone. That's a fairly comprehensive walk throughout the wood, um, and we picked up quite a lot of plants as either seed bearing or flower bearing in that, and they will all have to be treated. So what we'll be looking at here within this is devising then a set quadrat or monitoring system where it's repeatable. So we'll be able to look at the distribution of the plant, we'll be able to look at the number of plants within that distribution and then to say whether we're on top of it, whether we come to an agreed international recognition that what's a sustainable and maybe one flowering plant and 100 seedlings per hectare 
where there's going to be zero thermal intensity, 50 siemens per hectare, that will be determined at the outcome of the review on what we will be able to deem as being rural vendor free. We would differ, I suppose, in our opinion from others in relation to what we consider rhododendron free. So if you look at a plot that has a load of rhododendron like that in it, we may classify that as rhododendron free in the sense that there is no flowering plants or no seed bearing plants on it. So it goes into one of those maintenance suites like Trace alluded to earlier in relation to on a three or five or six year cycle, but you need to get back in there before it comes to that flower, flowering or seed bearing age again. So maintenance sweeps are vitally important on keeping on top of the, the areas that have been previously cleared. So while somebody could look at it and say, yeah, how much less rural energy free but I can count 40 to 50 plants ago in that photograph? From our perspective, we're saying it's rural energy free because there's no flowering or seeding plants in it. So I'm not going to say it's semantics or anything on that lines, but that's the way we look at it once we're staying free from the flowering and seeding plants and we keep it in our maintenance cycle. That's the way we're approaching it. So, the initial treatment, as I said, the follow up removal of dead plants, the treatment of regeneration along the lines regularly, scheduled visits thereafter, and again through contractors and volunteers. Sorry. Um, the phase treatments I think trades have been through, and I don't think there's any doubt about it. We need to do an initial phase, follow up by the second phase, and then regular maintenance sweeps after that. Sorry, these are just some of the photographs of the volunteers, and again, similar to trades, you can see the dense cover that people walk under. Um, Back to the treatment methods, again, had looked at the original days, foliar spraying, cutting and treating of stumps, stem treatment to break the tree, the physically pulling seeding the stippings without herbicide. So again, the foliar spraying has a lot of collateral damage. And I think that maybe, I suppose, the naivety and innocence in the early days was probably seen as the quickest, the most effective way, rather than aspect sprayer, go out, treat it, it's killed. In a site like we're in here, particularly within the National Park, and again, not knowing the biodiversity that's out in the wider reefs area in relation to our bryophytes and mosses and liverworts and all that, and with the discovery of the likes of the mouse tail fern and all that, the foliar spraying just cannot happen anymore. It's just, it's way too risky what we're going to lose and the potential impacts it has on a broader ecological context. Um, Clarny National Park has been relatively well studied from a botanical point of view, and for Rory Hodge to turn up the initial speech, the initial finding of the mouse cell fern, and then under funding from ourselves as part of our taxonomy studies this year, to find a second discrete population more than four kilometers away from the original one. It's only showing what's starting to be out there. Um, we've started quite a lot of taxonomic studies in the last two or three years, looking at particularly niche specialists, and some of the findings are exciting. Um, for the general of probably sitting in this room, it, it probably won't make a whole lot of difference, but we looked at Sacrophytic beetles this year, which are beetles that thrive on decaying wood and fungus and fungi and that kind of stuff. And we've actually two new species that have never previously been recorded in Ireland. And out of one of those is not recorded anywhere within the British Isles or Ireland, the nearest population is in Norway, Finland. So it's interesting to see what comes out for a park that's well known for its biodiversity and well studied and long established. There's still a huge amount to learn here. Um, so again, the folder spring is out specifically because of that reason. The grazing pressure has been mentioned earlier, there's no doubt about it, there's grazing pressure combined with rolling under it has an impact on our woodland regeneration. As does stock trespass, and as Flora said, like the numbers maybe have reduced now in comparison to what they were in the 90s, but we still have an element of stock trespass being both sheep and cattle, both coming into the park, both grazing in the woodland. So there it's a cumulative impact on our woodland as well as, as the rolling under side of things. So the Again, we're just going to go through the same thing. The dilution rates, as Tim had said in his video, for the larger plants is up to 14%. For the smaller plants, it's down to 5%. It's very targeted. Um, there's very little, if any, collateral damage in the, in the current method that we use, and it's quite effective. Mm -hmm. Timing is very, very important. Later in the year, as Tim said in his video, the drop off for the kill rate is quite slow to detect. But if you get your timing right, you'll get your success rate very quickly. Within three to six weeks, you know that you'll be fairly successful at what you're targeting in that period of time. So again, just looking for the, the finer stuff, even when you get down to seedlings, you must cut below the basal layer. You must go down before the very last leaf goat or shoot for this to work. If you leave anything above or sorry, below your cut, 
your lock will have an effective kill rate. Again, we've gone through the steam injection. Um, you can just see on the top, there's the hatchet metal here in the lower parts. You can see little incisions that were made by chainsaws. They were of the, of the larger diameter bowls and that kind of stuff. And um, the Marco die, as Laura, I think, found out his cost is invaluable to have, you know, because you don't find come back over the same ground a second or a third time. So the challenges, I think, have been well discussed. Again, like his, the terrain, um, even within the, the, the park ourselves, there are, there's going to be very specialist areas where it's going to require rope work. So even though we might clear an area of woodland, we're still going to have sea source above us, and we know we're going to have sea source. And it is frustrating, but trying to get suitably qualified people or contractors with the relevant skills to be able to get into those areas and tackle those is proving difficult for us. We're looking currently training us from a role staff in relation to rope access to work in those particular areas. But it does come with a problem. And I think like that from a broader context, particularly the likes of the REIT CIP, you're going to be in the same boat. So we, we have a solution for it. What's that, Trish? <laughs> We're getting some of the commercial guys that actually do um, rock climbing. Yeah. We're going to train them and we're going to utilize their right. skills. That's, that's similar to what we're looking at. We've looked at the people who do the rope work for the Shkellies, who are doing the masonry inside the Shkellies in relation to training up our own staff. We'll be chasing the same people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we will. But I mean, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a limited labor market. That's what should be targeted, you know what I mean? So, but like Trey said, and then like the, you had said yourself, the, the idea is that if you have a seed source within it, you're, you're, you're beat before you start because even though we might try and keep it, as free as we can, you still have that rain seed coming in on top of it. It's hugely labour intensive. I don't think anyone's under any illusion on that front. It's costly. Um, it's not easily done. Uh, but I think the method here, it's, it's, it's mimicking what was done above with the burn, the original burn light project, treating the hazel, having a group of locally qualified people that you can draw on is a phenomenal resource. Not only that, they'll get to know your farm, you get to know them. It's a really, really important thing from a community point of view. It generates an income um, and it keeps people living in the landscape. It's a huge positive all around. Uh, I've seen it, I've worked in Burn National Park for over 12 years and it's, it's a big plus, it really is. Um, resources, I mean, we're now starting to come back into an area where we're fortunate that we got a, a substantial increase in our budgets, both capital and current last year. And we'll hopefully continue along that vein, maybe it's not as much as we got last year. But for a protracted period when the country was in tighter times, the National Parks and Weather Service suffered, fully suffered. So therefore we were not able to commit as much as we could to commercial contracts along that lines. Although in saying that, 1.6 million is not a small amount of money to spend in a number of years treating wood Um, So I think we've been very fortunate along that lines that we've always been given that kind of resources to let back in here in Killarney in particular. So the future steps um, from our point of view is to conclude the review process. Once that con is concluded, it's actually to devise a new and detailed management plan for ongoing rhododendron in Killarney National Park. And that's something we'll be hoping to have completed within the next 18 months. So we will have a very detailed management plan drawn up and agreed within the next 18 months for the treatment of road in the park. To utilize our own in-house resources more effectively. Um, we've tried a number of different things. We've, we've looked at drones, we've looked at Sorry, I'm conscious now that I'm actually taking quite a bit of time. So we've looked at stuff in relation to using artificial intelligence, flying drones, tree canopy close, so flying drones in maybe February, trying to differentiate between holly, arbutus, ivory, and rhododendron. It didn't work. One of the things we've tried that we need to look at these opportunities to explore how our effective way of monitoring it is, how it's going to work. At the moment, we're looking at the I said to establish a strategic robust monitoring recording process establishing those repeatable monitoring transects within it. So for instance, if we take our five main habitats within the park, take a random selection of those habitats and within those habitats, take the random transects, then to get our scientific repeatable and robust monitoring and get that up and running. We're looking back again at the exploring the possibility of the engagement of the volunteers once, hopefully, COVID lifts and we get back to a little bit more international travel, looking at the involvement of citizen science, post-COVID and um, we had a meeting with interested groups during the week and the citizen science we'd be looking for would be a little bit higher than what's normally expected. We'd be looking for people who are relatively competent field skills in relation to repeating some of these transits. So the opportunities for there for to re-engage with uh, 
um, I suppose volunteer groups outside of the physical work get them more involved in maybe the scientific side of the house and that kind of thing. But we just need to look at having it right because the data that comes out of it has to be right. It has to be able to go into the data set to be statistically and analyzed. And we can't afford, I suppose, to have, I suppose, glitches in the data. We need to be able to do it right. So it would involve, and not be disrespectful to anybody, who would be more willing to do it. We do need people with a certain level of understanding of ecology and, I suppose, statistics to be able to record the correct method and put it back into our things from there. Um, one of the things we looked at this year was actually flying an aerial survey, a low level aerial survey of the park. Um, and you might find it very hard to believe it's very hard to get a settled weather window mm -hmm. in May or sorry, in May or June. Um, the plane has to fly at about 7,000 feet and can have no cloud cover or no mist. And getting that for three days in a row in the start of your summer, you would think should be easy. It's not. Um, we flew it a little bit later than the flowering season. But the photography, the level of photography and using the likes of LIDAR, we built in a couple of different layers into it, is it's phenomenal. And we would be confident enough that if we get the flight period right, it should be very helpful in relation to mapping the, the more dense areas. So ideally, the likes of areas, when you saw the picture of the trays, look at the likes of the vehement and flower, if we can get our flights at that particular time, it can give you an indicative area of the worst affected areas or the dense affected areas, just judging by flower and seed production alone from that side of things. So that's basically it. I think you thank you very much for your time. Um, I hold the questions, I think, until the QA session. And I think we have a small video to go for after that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a million for that, Seamus. Really interesting uh, work altogether. I am just going to test my skills of technology. And I think we are good to go. I'm trying to bring this right. All right. Okay, so next up we have a very special film that was created by Evan O'Sullivan. Um, Evan is actually currently in Nairobi, her mother told me um, a little while ago. And this film actually premiered during the Kerry Film Festival and it focuses on the Clarny Mountain Metal Group. And uh, Seamus mentioned them there. They're a voluntary group. They work closely with the National Parks and Wildlife Service on projects within the National Park. And they've done an incredible amount of work, it has to be said, on the ground in the management of rhododendrons. So sit back and have a look at I used to pass a sign on the road here saying metal volunteers wanted and I said I really must ring that number sometime and one day I did and I came out with them the first day and it was great because there was 25, 30 people there, it was sociable and a lot of rhododendron killed. Watch where we're stepping, take your time. Well you want to be relatively fit. The most important thing is your footwear. You have to watch yourself with fog holes. Proper rain gear. The terrain can be rough at times. The toughest thing is getting up early on a Sunday morning. You have to be ready for all sorts of weather. Killarney's like that. If you don't like the weather, wait a minute. Actually, when I joined the Mehel, I didn't know a lot about what the Mehel did. And I learned year on year about the pest that is the rhododendron in the park. The rhododendron pontigum, as we know it, the one you see in South Kerry today with that big purple flower, is a monster plant. It's like I, I actually call it rhododendron Frankenstein because it's a plant that's very difficult to control and manage. It's the nearest thing to the plant version of cancer that I'm aware of. I think it's a huge threat. There are several hundred uh, rhododendron species worldwide. The only problem one that we know of is rhododendron ponticum. It was introduced into Britain in the 18th century from the Iberian Peninsula into Kew Gardens. The gardeners crossed the original ponticum with other rhododendron species and they created a hybrid which was frost tolerant. It's poisonous to everything, nothing eats it. So the price of those showy flowers for two weeks in the year is all the other native flowers. Everything else underneath is gone. When you go into a place that's been completely covered in, a level five infestation, it's hard to describe unless you've actually seen it. A scene from Lord of the Rings where you go into this dark, absolutely dark, dense woodland, entanglement of branches and limbs. You don't know which direction you're in. This is the results of years of rhododendron 
growth that has not been checked in any way. And here you have it, like where this is this is the, the, the forest floor, the woodland floor. There's nothing, absolutely no, nothing here. Beneath this sort of a green outer shell with occasional flowers and everything inside that is dead. Then with your hatchet and your spray can, you can actually prevent this from continuing to grow. We do use herbicide, people may be, uh, you know, aghast to that, but we have perfected the method now where we're just targeting the stems of the plants and there's no collateral damage. The feeling initially is of hopelessness, but with the volunteers we have in the Bell, we are able to tackle vast areas of infestation successfully. Because the metal, this whole area is pretty much cleared now. Now you do have to come back in because the seeds, some do persist, so you have to keep coming back in over the years to make sure nothing else flowers. It's absolutely great to come back and see this because uh, there's the strong possibility that you would have nothing growing on the undergrowth here. I see the ferns are up already, they'll come anyway, but I see grass coming up uh, because these have all lost their foliage, there's sunlight hitting the ground and the natural vegetation has already taken hold. We brought it down to a place where we have the right method and, and it's up to having the resources now to carry out the control of rhododendron. Maybe for government to become involved as well and designate it as a noxious weed and provide funding for its clearance because it's endangering our native biodiversity. I don't know the ins and the outs of what has to happen for all of the rhododendron in the park to go and I don't think it'll be in my lifetime but I certainly hope that you know in my daughter's or in her child's life that we'll see less rhododendron in the national park. I have never gone out in the mail that I've gone home disappointed even on the worst day when the midges are eating your life or you're just soaked to the skin you just go home exhilarated after a day. The time actually goes quite quickly here because we have some great storytellers. It's really interesting finding out about almost hidden histories of the park. Even if you're just using the hatchet and you can hear hatchets going there and there and there and you know that, okay, I'm just doing this patch, but while I'm doing this, there's 25 other people doing all that. While we take the work seriously, it's we're not serious of, on our approach to it. They appreciate them an hour, an hour, two hours, three hours. Johnny can stay for the whole day some days, but depends on what you want. You can walk away from it any time you want, so there's no problem. People come from all over the world to experience Killarney and the beauty here, but it's really nice to be able to give back in some small way. and incredible and beautiful Killarney National Park is and how important it is to make sure that we can protect it uh, for many, many generations to come. That. So look, we want to thank uh, Minister of State Malcolm Noonan. Unfortunately, he wasn't here today, but I'm sure he'll be hearing lots of feedback from the conference here today. Also to Dr. Therese Higgins from Munster Technological University, to Seamus Hassett from the National Parks and Wildlife Service, Flora McCarthy, his neighbour and hopefully a friend now, and uh, to <laughs> Kathleen, uh, Valerie O'Sullivan and Evie O'Sullivan for the wonderful videos that we saw uh, today. Trisha Dean from the McGillicuddy Reeks European Innovation Partnership Project and South Kerry Development Partnership. Also from South Kerry Development Partnership and the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere is Eleanor Turner. The South Kerry Development Partnership for hosting us here today. Gerald, who worked his socks off there on the remote mic and on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for that, Gerald. And of course, to all of you for attending today and for spreading the word. Safe home to you all and thanks for joining us today.